Hi, welcome to Stocks to Watch for 2022 episode four here on Learn Grow Invest. So in this video, what we're gonna do is, you know, I have some some friends here that are gonna join me. We're gonna talk about, um, you know, how did how the market has been for 2022. Usually we start by saying, you know, how we go about adding stocks to our watch list. Then we each take turns saying, you know, one stock that we're going to be keeping an eye out for for the next few weeks or months, you know, however long we choose to, to say it for. And then each person kind of chimes in on that on that um that pick, right? So it's it's here for learning purposes only. So this is definitely not financial advice. Um, so it's it's one of our most popular segments. I really hope you do enjoy it. And you know, let's let's just get started. Learning is the key to successful investing. And who doesn't want to invest in some way? Here at Learn Grow Invest, we focus on financial education, all with the aim of sharing our knowledge on personal finance, investing, and building wealth. We do this on the foundation of our faith in God. If a more holistic approach is what you need, check out our Grow Faith-Based Financial Coaching Program. Find out more about us at learngrowinvestclub.com and follow us on all social media platforms at Learn Grow Invest. All right, welcome again. So let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for this day and for the fact that we're able to see it. We pray, Lord, that as we start this discussion, that your presence will be here with us. We thank you for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, everyone. So I'm going to ask you to welcome our guests. First, we have Miss Jodian Harris. Hopefully, I'm pronouncing that correctly. Hi, Jody. Next, we have Andre Thompson. I think everyone is familiar with Andre by now. And then last but not least, we have Julian Morrison. Welcome, guys. Hey, hi, Jeremy. Good hey, good evening, everyone. Hi. Good evening. Hola. All right, so Jody, we are definitely gentlemen here. So we're going to ask you to just oh. introduce yourself first and next, Andre, and then last, Julian. All right? Okay, no worries. Um, so I'm Jordan Ayres. I am a researcher. I've worked in the field of research for over 10 years. So I started in government looking at um, policy and economic development. And then I transitioned into looking more at equity and stock um, fixed income. So more research from a financial point of view. Okay, okay. thank you. Andre? All right, so I'm Andre Thompson. Um, a financial analyst with a focus on um, equities and asset management, and that's pretty much me. Okay. Okay, Julian. Good evening, everyone. I'm Julian Morrison. I too work in research. Right now, I actually run the research team at Proven Wealth. Oh, um, nice. Yeah, and it, it's a bit of a hybrid role, so. It's research and it has some project management aspects of it, but the bulk of it is research and research oriented things, valuation and so on. So we're into the thick of it as it relates to financial markets, both locally and internationally. All right, great, great. All right, guys. So, I mean, Julian and Andre, you've been here before. Julian, it's your first time, so I'll explain to everyone how, how we normally do things here. So normally we talk about, um, you know, just what, how we go about adding stocks to our watch list. Um, you know, what that process is, what we look for, what are some of the triggers that may cause us to take a second look at, at a company. And then we, we, we do that just to kind of give persons an understanding because most of our community members are beginners. So the question that we get a lot is, well, we used to get when we just started our community is, is what stock should I buy? And for us, we say, well, we can't tell you what to buy because that's not our role. But if we share our process, maybe, you know, all of us can help others develop their own process. So that's kind of the idea behind it. So I'll just ask each person to share their, their process and then we'll just, you know, go around doing our, our watch list from there. All right. So anyone can go first, really, just to, to get the ball rolling. All right, so if I'm going to begin, um, the process that I would normally work with in terms of, um, you know, 
selecting my investments is mostly like a top-down approach, you know. So, for example, I mean, most of us would trade Jamaican equities. Um, so, you know, want to look at the, the, the macroeconomic conditions in Jamaica, you know, your key indicators such as your um, inflation, your interest rates, your GDP, things like that. You look at the performance of each of the sectors and all of that. And from there, you know, once you find the ones that are operating favorably, you, 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 you take a deeper dive and look the companies that operate in those spaces. And then from there, you know, I, I tend to do my research about the company, their um, financial performance over the, the, the past couple of years, the strength of their balance sheet, um, the products that they have, their management team, you know, things like that, as well as the valuation of it. I compare their performance to that of peers and, you know, identify you know what opportunities are there for them to benefit from so that's to cut it short that's pretty much my answer <laughs> okay okay cool cool interesting similar a lot of things similar there to to my process i'll get to that soon though all right who's next okay i'll go next so i try to invest within the context of themes. So I try to invest thematically, which is similar to a top-down approach. So it's about putting different pieces of the puzzle together. But for instance, we will look at a given sector and how a sector is likely to perform within the context of a recession or a slowdown or an economic boom. So we also look at not just the data that that is presented by the authorities like Statin, PIOJ, Bank of Jamaica. We'll also try to use anecdotal evidence to confirm or test what we're seeing on paper. So I remember I was in the office a few weeks ago and I asked a colleague of mine, how do you feel about construction? You know, do you feel as if construction activity is slowing down? And he said, no, man, no, man. Um, so I said to him, you don't notice that compared to a year ago, you're not seeing as many trucks carrying material and you're not mm -hmm. seeing a lot of people with hard, hard hats and reflective this the way you used to last year. And he said, no, man. Um, and he explained that there are a lot of road projects that are still going on. And he said that a lot of building is still going on rurally, which is true. But, you know, a lot of the, 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 the formation of infrastructure is in urban areas. So even though you might have activity going on rurally, it might not be enough to offset a slowdown in urban areas because we find that a lot of projects are being completed and completion of projects might slow down the pace of building. So my thought process was that based on what I was seeing, there could be a slowdown. So Lumber Depot, they released their financials and their revenues were down significantly. Um, as in significantly in relation to expectation, most persons yeah. expected them to at least be flat because of the trajectory they had before. Yeah. And they were down significantly compared to expectation. And PIOJ, not PIOJ, sorry, Statin actually released the last GDP report at the beginning of October showing where construction was down 5% as a sector year over year. So it's just about putting all the different bits of information together to test what is on paper um, and to kind of get a forward looking a forward looking understanding of what's likely so that's i, I just said that to give an example of what i mean yeah 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 i, I mean it's it, it's interesting right because i thought at a similar thing right because we saw where the expectations for a lot of companies were showing in the stock price you know last year so you know, late 2020, we saw, you know, mail pack going through the roof. Then, of course, that was, you know, people were, you know, sobered up <laughs> last, last, last year. And still, I think there are persons who were expecting them to at least to close to what they did in, in 2020. And we're yet to see that. And construction was similar because I thought, um, you know, those construction, um, construction based companies were doing very well late last year coming into early this year and we're seeing you know those those results show now so yeah man interesting stuff Jodian? um yeah so my personal approach is a little 
different. So I think what everybody else does is really, you know, what is recommended to do. Um, <laughs> I think because I probably sometimes want to isolate myself from, from work and personal, uh, when it is that I'm doing it for myself, I actually ask somebody else for recommendations. Um, so I take myself out of, the in, out of the equation so that I'm not necessarily swayed um, by what it is that I know. But then I may never buy anything. And then I like to overthink. So as an overthinker, it takes a long time to make a decision. So if I really work with my headspace and making that personal decision, I may never buy anything. So I think my first step is really to ask somebody else, um, whether a financial advisor or the trader at work, you know, what you think I should buy. And then from there, I would start to look at it and say, okay, why? And I will question, and then I'll go into the deep dive. I um, mean, sometimes, um, similar to what Julian and Andre does, which is, you know, you know how this fits in the economy, how this fits with what's happening overall, um, you know, where to look, is this outlook, look at the balance sheet, look at ratios and stuff like that. Um, but just to take myself out of it, so I don't necessarily always start with what I think I should buy. I normally go to somebody and, you know, ask for a recommendation. Um, but then you always want to look at, look at it in the context of what is happening. So if it is that, you know, you're looking at a space um, or a sector, um that is not doing as well you know on a grand economic space then why is this one company within that space going to do well and yeah. so you start to ask your questions so you so you kind of do a lot of probing um about the company what is good about it what i like what i don't like um what's good about it how is it performing so i mean even though past is not indication of future as you mentioned with mail pack i mean if that were the case then you know it would just be continuing to go but you also have to look at what's the possibility and a lot of um, outlook on what is likely to happen and that future outcome is what really drives making the decision today. Yeah, interesting. I saw, how has that been working out for you? I'm curious. Do you find success having somebody else essentially doing the shortlisting for you? Um, so I think I, I'm also conservative. So even if they throw wild things out there at me, I probably still won't do it. So I typically will stick with, you know, your, your, your safe bets, um, your more blue chip type of things, um, because I'm just a little bit more um, conservative as an individual. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So I guess on a conservative basis, if I'm investing um, on a JSC, I guess my portfolio isn't doing well because all of those conservative stocks are generally don't. So, um, but, you know. Okay. Well, I mean, so I'd, I'd say... I'd, well, we, 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 we'll get back to that a, a little later, I think, because that's, that's an interesting perspective to hear, right? I, I never really anticipated you'd say that, but, you know, that, that's interesting. We'll, we'll talk about that a little yeah, later. Actually, I, yeah. I guess you're me. Um, you want me to give you a more um, no, fun no, no. textbook answer I could, but no, me that's... personally, that's just the craziness that happens um, for me. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um. For me, it's it's it, I I see my process as being very very simple. I focus on the on the business. I look to I I, I do take the, the approach of trying to understand what's happening around me. You know things that may may impact certain industries. I do like. Um, I think the companies that do so. Let me probably take a step back. So I'm investing for two reasons. I have short-term goals, and by short-term, I mean less than 12 months. Um, I say this all the time to persons. I have, you know, vacation each year. I have things that I may want to do in terms of home repairs. Maybe I want to, you know, um, do something nice for my wife for her birthday. Yeah, it's a baby too. Don't leave out the baby, bro. <laughs> Yes, exactly. And I, I'm actually a, a father now for a year. So I have things that I may want to do in the short term. But then I'm also, you know, thinking of, you know, how soon I may want to scale back in terms of work. So I may have a five year goal or a 10 year goal. So what I do is invest primarily. I put most of my cash into short term opportunities and then take the profits and put them back into my long term um, portfolio. So I do look for for opportunities, um, you know, twelve months or less, and that usually means then I'm focusing on what's happening now or what I think will happen three months from now, six months from now, 
So I try to find companies that I think will have a very compelling story, right? What's, what's the narrative? Have they been doing poorly for the last 18 months and now they're about to have a turnaround? Have they been, you know, steadily trending down? Um, and, you know, but, but there are certain things that point to it being a very solid company, but maybe it's a bad season for them. Maybe they're having shipping and logistics challenges now, so maybe they're not doing as well as they could be doing, but then three months from now, six months from now, things will, will get better. So I look at those things and then, um, you know, after I make those, those trades um, for the year, then at the, at the end of each year, going into the new year, I'll do uh, rebalancing for my portfolio. And then with those, those profits, I'll put them into companies that I think will be here, you know, 20 years from now. And we all know what those are. Those are, they are, are blue chip type companies. So that's kind of how, how I invest um so yeah so what we can do is um yeah someone kind of share their their first pick and why um so we we like to take at least um the bull case for the company i mean that's why it would be on on your watch list and then if anybody has any any reasons as to why they think the company may not do well um you know feel free to share that as well so I figure we can just, you know, go around um, and, you know, see, see what we have from there. So if each person can give maybe at least two picks, then that would be eight. Um, so that should, you know, take us about an hour, hour and a half, you know, just around the time that we normally have the, the session for. Okay, so I'll kick it off. And Thank I'll be you. brief because normally we have very um, extensive discussions. <laughs> So, I start with Fontana. I'm a Fontana bull, and that's because of where I think the company is likely to be in the next couple of years, as opposed to where it is now. But let me start with where it is now. So, Fontana has a very special business model. They have a footprint, branch footprint that is, that is heavily driven by communities that have very high levels of wallet share. So it's not just about the volume and the traffic, but it's usually in an area that is middle to upper income, normally in that range. So if you look at the product portfolio that Fontana carries on a retail basis, it typically appeals to that crowd. So these products are typically within reach of their target audience. So that's number one. Number two, the earnings driver continues to be the pharmacy. And we know that there is a very strong bull case for pharmaceutical products in Jamaica. There's population aging, the top 10 cause of deaths in Jamaica. I think about seven or eight of them are all lifestyle diseases. So, you know, there's a very strong steady demand for medication and pharmaceutical products in Jamaica for right now and for the foreseeable future so with, apart from all of that fontana has established itself as a retail experience that is unique in jamaica because when they step into a fontana location sometimes it doesn't it, there's no comparable experience within the context of jamaica it gives you that um advanced developed country department store kind of atmosphere and it's, you know, when you go there, unfortunately, not to put down my country, I love Jamaica, but when you go there, you don't feel like you're in Jamaica. In terms of the service, just the atmosphere. So all of these things combined is what makes Fontana special. If you notice, even before the, the, the Waterloo location was established, it was hard to get parking in Barbican. When you go there, you can't get parking. Parking is always full. So those are some of the indicators that you can use to show proof of concept in a business and the numbers show it. So their return on equity is north of 30% and the stock is at a PE that is just shy of 20 times. But the fact is because of where it is um, likely to be in the next couple of years and the context of a ROE that is 30%, um, that is not something that is not justifiable, right? Yeah. That kind of multiple is understandable because of the trajectory of the business. They want to build new locations. 
they just started building out their their warehouse in St. Catherine so that they can move goods faster because that kind of business is heavily reliant on the turnover on goods and how they manage their inventory. So all of these pieces of the puzzle come together to make a, a, a strong case for Fontana in my opinion. And of course it's a dividend payout. So that's also a plus. You're being paid to hold the asset so you can reinvest. What what's it what's the dividend yield? I don't remember. Um, um let me double check and get that back to you. Yeah, yeah. Just a second. What? Yeah, Fontana is interesting though. I remember you mentioning them for the last stock to watch that we had. As, yeah. Uh, and and what's interesting is that I think investors should start positioning for the Christmas trade. All the stocks that they think should benefit from the Christmas season are significant. I agree. And Fontana is one of them. So it's one of the Christmas stocks. So let me just get the dividend yield to you. I agree. Um, anyone else? Feel free to chime in as we go. Um, I I think I definitely like them. I'd say. Um, I think the price has been lingering below ten dollars for a while, and I think it's 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 down maybe what almost twenty percent around there from it from its high for this year. Yeah, um, the dividend yield is in the neighborhood of two point four percent. Okay. Um, yeah. I'm 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 not a fan of dividends lower than five percent, but <laughs> <laughs> to each their own. I mean, all I can say is you're being paid to hold the asset, so that adds to your return. Yeah. You know, yeah. it brings I mean, it, it brings the time horizon forward. To me, not worth the fees that you have to. I mean, if it like it's it's not the type of stock you buy for a dividend. Is 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 what I'll say. Oh yeah, I wouldn't go as far as saying it's a dividend stock. I'm just saying it's yeah. a sweet no. Yeah, you know? yeah. I'm gotcha, just saying it's gotcha. a sweet no. Yeah. But yeah, I agree. I agree with that pick definitely. Um, I've been saying to our our community that we already know what's coming for Fontana. So for the like the last eight months, they've been talking about the location in Portmore. We've seen photos. We've seen like four or five articles. So don't be surprised if in a few weeks you're gonna start seeing you know more volume coming in, and then you yeah. may see the price start to creep up a little bit. Um, so. Yeah. Because there could be two trades, Jermaine. There could be the trade based on the completion of Portmore, and mm -hmm. there could be the trade on the Christmas numbers. So when you cross those two exactly. together, Fontana should break out into a new trading range. That's the expectation in yep. the next six months. Yep. And it's still exactly. a single digit stock. So I agree. Exactly. I agree. I agree. Yeah. All right. Guys, thoughts, Andre, Jody. Yeah, I think Fontana is a good one, especially um, factoring in the long-term prospects that um, that Portmore location. And then, you know, so far they, they haven't really disappointed. You know, like um, I remember at that time it's a cyclical stock, so you know, um, to the Christmas quarter you normally see higher profit, higher revenue. But you know, for the other quarters that you'd be down, you know, you'd probably have below that hundred million thresh um, threshold right there. In recent times, they've been consistently, you know, improving their profits. So they're pretty much on an upward trajectory. Um, so I definitely think Fontaine is a good one. It has a it has strong brand equity. You know, if you go on social media, people seem to find a lot of comfort just going to Fontaine. Yep. So, you know, things like that are things that won't fade away. Those things will tend to stick around for a long time. So it's definitely a good one, you know, to hold, especially for the long term. Yeah, and beauty products are real, are real, um, are real value-added, value-added aspect of the retail experience. Because even though we might take it for granted, you know, you not buy no mac makeup or whatever, right? You not buy no lipstick, but still, you never know. It appeals to a lot of the clientele, a lot of wives, mummies, aunts. Um, they bring their kids, and it can be a family experience. So while you yeah. boring and gone, go look for medication, you know, your wife gone look on the makeup and the kids gone upstairs to look on the toilet. So right. it's a family yeah. experience. Yeah. 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 And I mean, even even the flagship location, a lot of good business is there. So yeah, yeah. there's even that too. Yeah. That will yeah. always yeah. stick to the perfect. Yeah. yeah. You have a ma you have a you have a Scotia machine and an NCB machine one time. Plus yeah. Starbucks. And you have yeah. um Wendy's. Wendy's. 
so it's strategic if you if you yeah. card machine now or for anything to the ATM there. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> work yeah, everybody. The cool thing, um, the the escalator seems to appeal to the public too. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, and I mean, everywhere I mean, in Jamaica, you see escalator. So as exactly. as, yeah. as you would <laughs> say, it's a coming like Jamaica at all. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. There is, I think. I think it's a TikTok or something that goes around where, like, you see the wife goes out, she went to Target, um, you know, to pick up one item and she ended up spending X hours. I think that is our version of a Fontana. Yeah. Um, it's somewhere that you go to pick up one item, but then you end up buying, you know, probably other things you didn't necessarily plan to get. Um, yeah. So there's definitely, as you said, you know, that brand equity with Fontana. Um, that's a lot of people like. Uh, I think one of the things I'll note, particularly for people who are, new in the market though um is that i think when the market was booming in like probably 2019 you'd have heard a lot of young people say things like you know if we just didn't know and we did buy this from long time you know i think what's happening now is the opportunity to buy things um at prices that probably you're, you weren't able to um you know because you weren't in the market at that point in time so yeah, yeah. if it is that you look at like a fontana trading you know at around nine dollars is an opportunity um, as a, you know, a relative has mentioned before, a discount um, to where things were, you know, at the start of the year. So, I mean, if you missed your gate or you missed that opportunity, then it's a time to kind of get, you know, get some foothold into it. So, I think the market is presenting with opportunities. So, it's almost like a resetting in some ways. Um, not totally, but, you know, it's an opportunity to probably buy at greater value um, and at lower prices um, for things that you probably missed, you know, two years or a year or three ago. Um, yeah. So... Fontana would be one of those. So, <laughs> oh, what I'd say, because I like, I, would, I, I don't want to hear at least one sort of bear case, right? So I'll, I'll just mention this because I mentioned it, I think, in the last one as well. I always thought that Fontana was going in the opposite direction, meaning still investing in physical locations, right? I never understood why you would do that. But then, you know, the more I thought about it, I was like, I guess it's a, island thing where a person still like this idea of going to somewhere because i remember yeah. when, they, when when the ipo would and you know i thought about them investing in the waterloo location i was like what's the point but then we we saw how they how how their you know performance has been since um i i do think i think about how much can they really grow over the next couple of years mm -hmm. uh, you know what's what's their ceiling, right? So let's say three to five years from now, if they have what, two more locations, at some point will they still be able to generate, um, you know, impressive results? So just, you know, two things I think about for them, you know, something that, you know, I, I, I thought I'd mentioned, you know, since we're, we're, we're talking about them now. All right, all right, Jeremy, so I'll answer you with that. So I'm there with you within the context of capacity, mm -hmm. but, what makes Fontana interesting is that, remember, it's a hybrid. So they're selling consumer discretionary. So you have your Nick Snacks. You're talking about the makeup. You're talking about the toys. You're talking about mm -hmm. the ice cream, blah, 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 whatever. Right? The stuff that lures people there. And you have consumer staples slash healthcare. So those are the pharmaceutical products. Because remember, the drive of earnings is the medication. Yeah. It's not really so much the Nick Snacks. And that's according to management. It's not me so. Mm -hmm. So in terms of the engine of Fontana, it's really the story around healthcare and the volume of medication that's likely to, 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 to move in the future. So what I'll say to you is in the US, it is said that 10,000 baby boomers retire every day, right? And if you annualize that, that's in the millions. And if the same thing is happening in the US, it's a similar trend in Jamaica within the context of people who are in our parents' age group, they're starting to slow down. And what you find is that medical conditions, they don't get worse in a linear way. They get worse exponentially. So mm -hmm. like your health between 62, or your health between 52 and 57 is more similar than your health between 62 and 67. It's like a bigger gap. Mm -hmm. So the point I'm making is, Fontana's trajectory has a lot to do with the aging of the Jamaican populace. That's really the that's the secret bull case. I shouldn't really be saying okay. this enough. But that's the <laughs> secret bull case of Fontana. Not so much 
Oh, it's pretty. I'm going to buy some ice cream, some makeup. That's a, Yeah, that's there. Because there's a lack of amenities in Jamaica. You see people yeah. complain about lack of things to do. We bored, we go movies, all the same restaurants, whatever. So it's an, it's, it's an amenity by itself. But also, you have that thing that is bubbling in our society, which is a secret yeah. healthcare crisis. All right, fair enough, fair enough. I got you. Got yeah. you. yeah, I mean, I think just to add, you also, believe me, is that right? <laughs> I think just to add, though, um, in terms of, like, you know, you said that a lot of people are first time investors. Um, another thing in that case to look at is, is, is management and how it is that you probably would have seen them transition or change. So, even though you know, we may think that the move out is moving away from brick and mortar. I think you would see in terms of how it is that they were able to operate in a period of time where people were locked down. How is it that they did what uh, measures they put in place is kind of give you an indication of what it is that management or the company would factor into. So if it is that there are changes um, in trends to come, um, how it is that they are going to operate in that context. And that would give you some idea of you know the experience or the probability um, of survival later down. Um, if it is that things are to change, how it is that management is able to adjust or how quickly it is that they adjust um, to change it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I just thought they'd be investing more in technology, right? So that that's kind of where I was going. I thought they would be trying to, you know, improve their their um, their ability to, to distribute, take orders online, you know, expand their reach, stuff like that. I thought they would have mentioned plans to maybe open, you know, Fontanas in in other countries. Those are the kind of things that I was kind of hoping to see. But yeah, I think we've kind of rinsed Fontana thoroughly for the last twenty minutes. So, all right, let's 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 take another one. Okay, I guess uh, Andre, go ahead. I'm sure, Jody, the ladies yes. first. No, I'm hoping that somebody picks one that I have, and then I'm just like, oh, so I only have one to do. <laughs> All right, well, my pick would be Jamaica Broilers. Is that one? That's that one. <laughs> All right. So my pick would be Jamaica Broilers. Um, since recently, you know, their performance, it's def it's one to watch. That I'm, I'm eager to see how they um, continue to perform, you know, going forward. For the last couple of quarters, their net profit has actually passed the billion dollar mark. And, you know, this would have been amidst um, a downturn in in, in economic conditions you know they have they, they have been challenged by higher cost of grains higher shipping costs things like that and it has actually taken a toll on the margins but the growth in revenue has been the primary driver in terms of the company achieving the billion, the billion dollar mark in terms of profit if you look at the profit outturn um for the last three quarters, they've been consistent with it. So, I mean, you know, their product is pretty much inelastic in demand. So, you know, um, demand doesn't really change that much when there's price increases because at the end of the day, you know, chicken is probably like the number one meat consumed in the world. So when they will add on their prices, you know, people are still likely to buy. I've always been hearing people complain about KFC when a chicken box was probably like 500 thing no it's you know way past that and they're still buying it so i, I believe that the, 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 the their ability to pass on price increases to the consumer is is greater than that of you know the, the consumer dis discretionary companies and things like that so one could argue and say you know that could be a driving factor for the increase in revenues um and i take that and i note that um, however, if you were to also factor in the performance of the respective segments, you know, the, the Jamaica operation, the mature segment, it's it's still growing. And when you look at the US segment, that's, you know, that's a huge market and their their um, performance there has been continuing to grow well. So I'm eager to see if they are able to maintain or even improve on the, the, the profits that they've been um, generating since recently. Um, you know, shipping costs have somewhat come down, commodity prices have somewhat come down. So this might bode well for the company with respect to improved margins. I think if you look at like the, the margin for the March 2022 financial year, that was around um, 4%. And that actually compares to about 15% the prior year. But still, the profit outturn was much greater. 
So that's one that I want to continue to watch going forward. If you look at the um the, the pricing of it, uh they're pretty much trading at a PE of eight times. And this would compare to the, the, the broader market trading at around 15 times thereabout. Mm -hmm. If you look at the return on equity, the, it exceeds that of their peers. And you know, at the end of the day, it's a blue chip company. You know, these are companies we expect to stick around. Um, so pretty much to cut it short, that's that's definitely a start that I'm watching. And you know, they they've announced that they're going to discontinue the Haiti operation yes. in a yes. loss. Yes. So you know that might that might further contribute to a greater profit, greater earnings. Yeah, yeah. There was something that we were talking about, I think, in the last stocks to watch as well, uh, whether or not, or when, or, or maybe it was when we were doing the, the stock review. I don't remember, but we, we, we spoke about it earlier this year, right? Um, oh, no. So I'm mixing it up. I think it was when um, Khalila was doing the interview with the CEO, persons were asking, are they going to discontinue operations in Haiti? I, at the time, it seemed like they, they hadn't made a decision about it, but yeah. I mean, I guess it just it, it's something that maybe for now, maybe they just it, maybe it's the best thing for them to do. I think that the market doesn't appreciate Jamaica broilers. I'd, I'd say that um, I think it used to trade a lot better before the pandemic, because um, I remember when it used to be somewhere around 40 or higher. Uh, I haven't really seen that. I, I've well. In general, I think a lot of companies don't get, aren't valued appropriately. I'll use that term. Um, and JBG is one of them. I do like them, but I think that, I think that um, maybe something a, a different catalyst for them. I don't think performance is what the market will 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 respond to for them specifically. Is what I'd say. Yeah, um, I think I believe that you know it's it's a huge company. Um, it's one could probably argue it's one that you know maybe institutional investors would more favor because you know retail as retail investors they you know outsize it's more, it's it's more Jody kind of company right <laughs> <laughs> so you know like the retail investors want fast growing ones so you know you look at the ipos the ones that are mm -hmm. in a position to report explosive growth in earnings while jbg is you know more of a stable one so yeah. in the context now where um you know fixed income has increased in attractiveness one can argue that you know maybe that's what has the focus of institutional investors so you know that <laughs> jvg would really benefit if retail investors not really favor it. but i believe at the very least one should be able to somewhat main preserve their capital so um if you look at the price performance on a year-to-day basis it's down 2.6 percent and you know that would compare to a, a much broader decline in the market which you know is in a double digit um decline mm -hmm. as yeah. well as you know, the us markets as well so that's you know that's that goes show that you know i think we'll ask andre for a few moments there yeah i'll, yeah. I'll chip in so regarding boilers mm -hmm. i Boy, it's like you have that student in your class who you know is an A student and then keep coming up with Bs. <laughs> I just have an issue. I have an issue with their liability management. Yeah. Um, when you look at their their margins, I think they can do better as it relates to cost controls. Maybe not variable costs, because yeah. some of that might be out of their hands. But as it relates to their fixed costs, I'm not sure if they are using solar power and wind power and all the type of green investments that they might be able to do i'm not sure if they're retooling their energy mix so they can optimize their margins because yeah. i think their fixed cost structure can take some improvement apart from that of course it's a solid company what i love is that they've been building their capacity through and through yeah so you're talking about new plants you're talking about new um, assets building out their, their their entire productive base and that will allow them to scale and to keep growing revenues. So I love that about broilers. I just think they can do better as it relates to their, their middle line. And I think the exit from Haiti might feed into that being an improvement as it relates to their costs. Yeah. 
So the, the only thing I would say that might counteract it is the fact that interest rates are going up. And broilers are a business that sometimes refinances often. So they might be refinancing at a higher level. So they might see a creep up in interest costs. So I'm not sure if their interest expense is going to net out whatever savings they might make from the exit from um, Haiti. I'm not sure. It's, it's really a catch-22. But based on what um, Andre was saying, definitely it's oversold at eight times. And yeah. I think that has a lot to do with the rotation from in institutional investors from equities to, to, to bonds. So it's more a story of market structure and where we are now because of higher interest rates. Um, but at eight times, it's definitely a steal. It's, it's ridiculous. It should be closer to like 12 or 14. Hands yeah. down. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it's peers are pretty much trading at 15 times, 16 times. Apologies, guys, had some internet issues. Um, yeah, managed yeah, to catch yeah. the last part of um, what your, your feedback, Julian. And I yeah. agree. Um, the growth in earnings is good, but pretty much what will give support to a much greater flow to the bottom line would be how they can contain their expenses. Yeah, man. So that has been my that has been my 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 hang up my ball for years now because of that. Because I want to see them win. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but yeah. So, see. I mean, see. Hopefully, you know, the ease in the shipping cost and um, you know, if commodity prices can continue to trend downwards, that would at least help the direct costs. They will need to, you know, improve their um their admin expenses. I mean, you know, right now, finance expenses does take a chunk out of um the earnings and um you know given the environment that we're in interest rates are you know elevated right now so but jay you need to call him and say yo you need to drop in some solar i remember energy yeah. price is not coming down yeah. that much you know yeah. Yeah. Right. i'm telling you yeah. so they must have to do something <laughs> i mean see we, 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 a recession somewhat loading you know, OPEC plus they, they cut um the number of barrels yeah. per day. So I mean that yeah, significant that the well for energy prices and then so yep. Yeah. And what they do is energy intensive because they have to mm -hmm. keep the chicken at the right yeah. temperature and all yeah. of that. Yeah, they use a lot of cooling and anything that has to do with cooling and refrigeration takes a lot of energy. So they are very sensitive to energy prices. That's not yeah. a game. So yeah. my fingers are crossed. Yeah, so this is the I have it on the list. It's it's one to watch to see how they can navigate these waters. Oh, it's a big play for Christmas though, hands down. Yeah, man. Because this is the first post-COVID Christmas, so yo. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Chicken on every table. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jordan, any thoughts on JBG? Um, so for JBG, I think the, the lesson learned um from it is I, I'm happy that they exit the Haitian um business. And I think that, you know. When you're looking at your portfolio, sometimes you go into things and you're expecting it to degrade and it don't degrade. And sometimes you have to cut your losses. So I think that's a good lesson learned for us as investors that, you know, sometimes you have to exit a position. Um, and so I'm happy that they're exiting that portion of it. Um, my other concern with JBG is really um, how it is that the, the debt that they carry. So I think one of the things they want to look at companies during a period such as this um, you know, it's a little focus on the balance sheet and, you know, how it is that they're able to manage debt and they kind of have quite a bit of, of debt there that's growing. And then, you know, as Julian mentioned, refinancing could lead to, you know, higher um, costs in terms of financing. So those would have been the two concerns. But also on the flip side, um, in recessionary period, we recommend staples um, and, you know, chicken is a staple. So, you know, it is not all bad um, for the chicken company. So there are still some positives there um, in terms of how it is that they are, should be able to, you know, get better in terms of profitability. Okay. Okay. I mean, it, it's it's a company that that I've liked for a while. Um, I'm definitely I don't think it's gonna re-enter my my watch list for a long time. Like I'd have to see something. Um, I really think their their expansion in in the US is is a is a good move for them to to continue to do. Um, I think that, uh, I mean, with, with, I heard somebody say it, I think recently that you have more or, or just as much Jamaicans outside the country than currently in the country. I don't remember who said it. No, actually I have more. 
We're actually have more that, that's that, that 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 is what i'm thinking right so to me um there there are countries or or areas for them to to expand right because as you guys say it's a it's a stable I, I like to see companies aggressively grow and expand right that's what i look for i think they have the the resources to be able to do it um i think they don't they don't necessarily um well, I don't know. I can't. I can't speak to anything that I've seen where where it says they're not interested. But it kind of seems like everything is kind of um, said as it is. Everything is kind of as you as you said those those opportunities that they have as maybe low hanging fruit to take advantage of. I think they should, and then maybe we'll see the market responding differently to it. But I I I used to be a shareholder right around right around 2018 2019. It was one of those stocks that I really love to trade because it used to do this nice little movement between like, you know, 23, 24 to like 35. So you get a nice little, you know, movement there, but it hasn't been doing that for a long time. It just kind of stuck at 26, 27. Um, so I'm not, I'm not really interested long-term maybe, but definitely not in the short term for me. All right. So 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 now we get the the blue chip. Pick so I actually from... have two. So I have our main market and our junior market. So okay, start 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 with the main market. I think the the junior market okay. picks can, can come a little later. Okay, so I guess for me, uh, um, it's the Cinco. I think they have been doing well, um, and they were able to um during the period of time when we were locked down and you know they weren't able to gain as much from the local market they were able to transition to do a little bit more export and so i like that management um was able to to do a little bit of shifting based on the conditions and you know time so the margins even though i think gross margin did a little bit of a dip um year over year uh, i think in terms of the net profit margin that actually improved and so you know one of the things with companies such as you know, within this space is that they should be able to um, maintain margins because, you know, they are a food company and there's still going to be some amount of demand. Um, even though we are heading into um, a recessionary period, um, they still are producing, you know, somewhat goods or items that are needed. So, I mean, snacks and juices are things that are now back on the roster because children are out for school. And so that's one thing I like. Um, in terms of looking at the balance sheet, I think that probably is really... You know what i like most about it um in terms of when you look at the ratios um they have very little debt um they have quite a bit of cash um in terms of their you know those like nice yes so um, i think what that positions companies at this point in time you know in the same way that as investors we are looking for companies in a dip period to kind of fall down in prices and we get good value is the same way big companies are looking for opportunities um, and so if they have cash, then there's an ability for them to, you know, probably do acquisitions or to do expansions um, that could bode well for them in the future. That's what I would but, love to see from Wisinko. Like, they have the it, capital, but, like, gobble up yeah. some companies, man. Um, you could see it. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know that you will, but you could. And so that's an opportunity. And I think a similar one to Wisinko in terms of balance sheet and, you know, that sort of assessment would be JP. Um, you know, they kind of have that opportunity there that if it is that the opportunity presents itself that they could do acquisitions, um, that would bode well. And, you know, as you know, I have a preference towards those blue chips. So, you know, I may be biased in my view of like in the old and boring. So, yeah. I, I really like Wisinko. I think that it's, it's I, I think what's well, earlier this year, I think it was about $26. It's around 18 now. So that's what... Um, 30 percent about a 30 percent down so i think i think it's like 32.5 32.5 percent down so I, I, yeah. I really think it's at a good price i i i just want to see them do something with that cash i mean like it's 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 been a minute um i really like it. oh sorry i'm mixing it up sorry i was going to say doing something but then i was thinking of jp my bad yeah so to be fair to be fair though german to kind of cut them some slack uh they did a partnership with um with where they park didn't they mm -hmm. yeah they did the partnership with where they park and they also have the partnership with 
with um, JP Snacks. So yeah. it's not as if they're not doing anything at all. I yeah. think I think what Jeremy mean though is in the current climate and with the current cash file because I think those partnerships were pretty much pre-COVID. Yeah, they were. Yeah, so mm-hmm. I think yeah, they, they, you know, given whatever opportunities COVID are presenting. So if it is that, for example, they're waiting for because I mean, Jodian kind of alluded to it. If it is that, for example, they're waiting for opportunities for maybe some companies to maybe be at a lower price, um, like. At least for me, and I mean, this kind of goes to the general issue that I have with companies in general. If you have plans, we don't know about them. (laughs) So, I mean, if it is that they they communicated any such strategy, approach, I mean, then then one could be a little bit more optimistic. But it almost gives the impression that they're kind of comfortable the way things are, making money, trying to keep things steady, you know, but... I understand that you needed to navigate the the uncertainty of the pandemic, you know, et cetera. But I really like the company. I'd really love to see um, you know, some something, some some catalyst that could maybe have persons um, you know, kind of excited, right? Because I mean, I'd, I've I've been a shareholder for a long time. So I am I am eagerly, you know, wanting to see them do just you know interesting and, and innovative things right um so that's kind of my my perspective i think i think if memory serves me correctly i think it seems or they are alluded that you know their focus in terms of growing would be more on the, on the um organic side you know with respect to improving because you know there's more you know at the end of the day the acquisitions and all of that are the you know the the, the, the exciting and interesting ways that companies growing but then um you know sometimes not all acquisitions really blend in i agree way. with that i agree with that so let me let me tell you why why i look at it that way um let's say that you are a shareholder for a company we know that the blue chip companies they don't they don't fluctuate i mean there there's not large volatility so let's say that i'm a shareholder for a company for 10 years, most companies in Jamaica pay dividends of around 2 to 3%, right, Julian, around that range. Yeah, about that. So, so I'm holding this company for 10 years. The price is not fluctuating much. I'm getting 2% if I'm a shareholder per year for 10 years. That That's just not... You, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. No, but... You understand what I'm saying? <laughs> No, but Jeremy, we think you're, you're, you're kind yeah, of harsh. Yeah, I think I think I've been a little bit with harsh, Jeremy. But 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 no, as in I understand Jeremy's point mathematically. Sometimes, 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 um, blue chip companies do break out. They might not break out like a junior market company, mm-hmm. but sometimes they break out because the market has their cycles. So there's mm-hmm. gonna be a day. When institutions come back heavily into equities, it's gonna be a day when that comes back. What if the regs changes? What if the regulations around pension funds give them more latitude to allocate more resources to equities? That would like bring us to a totally different paradigm. That's just an example. Mm. But where 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 I have your, your your concern, um where I share your concern is just the the um the vagueness around future value creation mm-hmm. i understand that and i'm there with you um they said they want to expand heavily into exporting which is necessary because i think about more than 90 percent of their revenues come from jamaica right so it means that they barely scratch the surface yeah, as it barely. relates to, mm-hmm. to to exports and i think people overseas have great appetite for their products Yes, I think so. so too. Maybe that's maybe that's a big boom that you're looking for. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's really the export story. I'm not sure how they're going to pull it off, so, but maybe that's it. So, so that's so that's why to me, and and this is this is my expectation, right? I I I think that so in general, that's why I usually look for and ask for companies to do at least double-digit dividends. If you're the type of company making consistent profits. 
um, you know, profits in the high hundred millions or billions, you should be able to pay a double digit dividend. Boy, Jeremy, and I think double digit kind of rough still. I mean, <laughs> you, want, you want to reinvest into the business. Yeah. Like your, your no, but, 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 okay, so so we're not talking about what we think of specifically now, but for the companies not doing that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah, with that. I agree. I agree. Yeah, the there, are, there are definitely instances where companies can be better as it relates to dividends. I won't fight that at all. I'm I'm not gonna, maybe that was think about. Well, let's, yeah. let's look at it this way, though. I mean, you know, the dividend yield is pretty much the dividend per share divided by the price. Ideally, we want capital appreciation. So, you know, that if the price is going up, they I will mean, be churning, churning or paying out. That you want both. <laughs> I want I both. Think, you think it's a case where, you know, sometimes you kind of have to choose. Mm -hmm. Because if your yeah. stock price is going up and your investors want a double digit return, then you will have to be paying out profits aggressively. And then, for example, in the case of a, a Wisinko, that you know they probably still have their aspirations you know, in terms of growing or you know doing the acquisitions that and so forth, they're going to need cash to, to do that. So mm. the thing, the thing with Wisinko, why I would give them a blay as it relates to their their cat their attitude towards cash is because um we're in a climate where inflation is stubborn and interest rates are going up so if it is that they have they have more cash than they need it means that they will always be able to borrow cheaply so they're borrowing because they're, they want to not because they have to yeah it's the same thing with fontana fontana has a lot of cash relative to their needs so when companies yeah. borrow when they want to, as opposed to when they have to, it limits the increase in their interest expense, which is an advantage over their their um competitors in some instances. So I see in that context where it can be a strategy where they try to um hoard cash. But broadly, I think yo, Jamaican companies mean with dividends. Very the mean man is the word the I mean, would... man, the mean. Some no. of them, definitely. I won't call their name right now, but yo, them <laughs> yeah, I, I can't think of one and two that you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't care the better. No, Trust um, me. So, I mean, average the average dividend, as I said, is somewhere around two to three percent. Somewhere yeah. less. Yeah. I'm like, what's the point? It's, so to me, those companies, well, so yeah, one the junior, dollars. junior market yeah. companies shouldn't be looking to pay aggro aggressive dividends so i'm actually not talking about any junior market company i think i think if you're if you're on the junior market you should be in growth mode right once once you're at main market though meaning companies that your 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 business model is like simple standard like all you're doing is is, is just racking up profits pay the dividend like even even um Trans Jamaica, that's on the higher end. I was expecting a better dividend than 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 they announced, honestly, because I thought that they would have said, okay, you know, things are kind of back to normal now, and you know, they they they've they've done a price increase recently. You know, pay 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 a nice dividend, right? Um, so I agree that you know the dividend could be more, but at, from a two to three percent deviation to double digits, I think you know you kind of you kind of want to leap too far. Um, I think you know earlier when you said you know you want you look at companies you know five percent and over. I mean I was a little with you there, uh, but the leap to two to double digits, you know, is, I think is a, it's too much of a big jump one time. Um, it's probably what I'd say, mm -hmm. and and just to note that also, particularly what you would have noticed during. Um, this period where we had the shipping issues um, and yeah. what a lot of companies in retail space had to do was to beef up that inventory and so that is where you want to still have some amount of cash um so when these situations are times come you have some cash that you can run in on and you know use to beef up um your inventory so i think when you look at companies um in terms of how it is that you know, during the period of time where they weren't able to get goods. And I think, you know, somebody had mentioned to me that at one point you were going into stores and you were seeing um, goods, you know, the, not the ones that are typically for our market. So you'd see them, but with Spanish labels, um, we should have shown the extent to which sometimes how difficult things were in terms of getting, you know, commodities or goods to us in this market. And so having that cash buffer. So when it is that you look at most of these companies' balance sheets, 
you notice that inventory is up. I mean, part and parcel of the fact that prices are higher. So, I mean, it may not necessarily all be the fact that, you know, if you see a double, it means that they're double in terms of goods, you know, part of that is that prices are also higher. But they are able to use some of that cash um, to deploy and to, you know, beef up in terms of inventory so that goods would have been there and available. And I think um, Fontana is one of those companies that spoke about, you know, being able to beef up inventories in a period um, during COVID, during where we had these shipping challenges. So you still want to, I think probably Prudence and, you know, board and the directors and stuff sometimes want to play that conservative end. Um, but, you know, I guess it's to find that balance um, between, you know, the double digit reveal and the two to three. So and probably so I, land somewhere five to seven I get, probably. I, I get i get i get the prudence right so to me I, as i said you know it's it's it, it if it's a situation where you know you're the type of company that that investors are not likely to see capital appreciation and i think those companies know who they are right and a lot of them will actually say you know um this is this is you know the best way to to, to, to manage our funds, we need to scale back the economy, X, Y, Z. I get that. I think if you're not able to provide um, modest capital gains, you should compensate on the side of, of dividends. Because again, I'm thinking about those investors holding the company for years. If Especially those companies who have not paid a meaningful dividend over the last two years, three years, so you have investors where the stock price is down, no dividends, or or just one two percent dividends. They're like, you know, what's happening? So that's that's kind of you know what what I'm I'm going at. So, um, so just just to, um to add to that too. Um, I, I can say you know at least you know there's definitely one benefit to having all of that. Uh, having a, a large cash pile is that you know with high interest rates, your money is worth more. You know. Not only we see it on the interest expense side, but also on the interest income. Like um, you can get favor at the very least. You know, companies can get favorable um, rates on short-term deposits, repos, things like that. Um, and then you know, during also during these times of uncertainty, you know, some companies probably you know they they more up to just um, be capitalized than just up to be more defensive. I mean, we've seen it with Proven where, you know, they pretty much announced that, you know, they're not really in any acquisition mode right now, given um, economic conditions. NCB hasn't really been paying any dividends because they want to remain as capitalized as they can, uh, um, you know, as we endeavor on these uncertain times, things like that. So, you know, sometimes the market, you know, in various cycles, you know, there will be times of booms, times of busts. So given that, you know, we're pretty much on a downturn now, it could be a strategic approach which would benefit investors in the long term you know once conditions are more favorable you know they have all the cash to deploy you know to for for their capital activities for acquisitions investments and so forth i mean i think i think the standard i think jsc should should tell the companies don't pay a dividend unless you can do five percent or more <laughs> i think I, I think that should be a part of the the, the rule book right <laughs> suppose, but suppose that deter them from listening then I mean, it, so, we want a lot of listings. We want deep, more deep in the financial markets. What, what, what else? I mean, as as is, the, as the <laughs> the appreciation side compensates for it. Yeah, I don't want to derail the conversation, but I mean, I'm just it's it, it, it. No, it the, pains the dividend, my heart. Pains the dividend my heart. thing is a real is a real issue. What mm -hmm. I what I say is maybe they could do more frequent special dividends because once upon a time. Apart from the normal um, interim dividend, companies mm -hmm. used to just pay out a special dividend like for no reason. And used to just yeah. give you a sweet now. We haven't seen that in a little while. So we could definitely see some more special dividends um, to kind of boost market sentiment yeah. and compensate shareholders because, as you can see, market conditions have changed um, yeah. considerably. So, I mean, I think all of this. I think the, the the perspective that I have for a lot of these companies would be different if they were more transparent about what they're doing. Um, a lot of the plans are vague, very high level, um, you know, and I really don't like to hear the word we're trying to improve shareholder value because that's a very vague term. I don't know what it means. 
uh, because if, if you see you you want to boost shareholder value and I wait six months, I wait 18 months, I wait 24 months and nothing changes, I'm going to try it. I'm like, what does value mean to you? Because if nothing has changed for the company in 24 months and you said you want to improve share, shareholder value, I'm going to be questioning which shareholders and you know what's what what's your priority, right? So that's that's kind of what I'd say there. Um, okay. Yeah. So, all right. So my turn. Um, well, I, I kind of I've been kind of back and forth about mine. I do. I do like. Um, Oh boy. Uh, so I like I like Trans Jamaica. Um, I think that I think that they are definitely undervalued at current price. I'm very disappointed with the dividend. I said that a few moments ago, but I still think that um, they have a ways to go. Um, we know the story was kind of struggling through through the pandemic. The timing of, of the IPO. I mean, nobody saw that. Um, and you know they were they were hovering around a dollar twenty for a while early this year actually went to one ninety one and now it's hovering around one forty eight one forty six there about um, I think I think it's a company that um, will do well both short term and long term um, I think there are opportunities for them I'm I'm waiting for them to to announce some more of their upcoming projects that we do know about um, one that's meant to complete 2023. Um, I was hoping to see them take on projects outside of Jamaica as well. But I think for, for price slash dividend slash potential growth and value, I think it, 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 it hits those, those, those check marks for me. I think the product is simple and easy to understand. It, it's not going to change much. Um, and so I think um, I'd wish to see them innovate maybe a little bit more simple things that, that would make a uh, person's, um, you know, things like, you know, card machine at the toll or like things that you can help just kind of get through, get through things a lot, a lot simpler. Um, I'd love to see them take on um, projects and opportunities outside the country. As I said, I think that's one of the things I'd, 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 I'd want to ask. I haven't been able to interview the CEO as yet, but that's one of the things I'd ask him about. Um, so yeah, that's, that's me. I think that it's been on my list all year. So I'm still waiting to see them go to where I think they can go. But um, yeah. Any yeah, thoughts? I think the last time when um we had the stocks to watch, mm -hmm. I think it was it was one that you know was a favorite of um you um yourself and mine. But um I think it, it, it yeah I, I think I, I actually agree. I think it's a good stock and you know the outlook for it is is um somewhat favorable. You know they they have right of first refusal for the the mandible leg of the highway that's to be completed in in around March 2023, um, you know, they announced their intention to acquire um, JIO. Um, you know, if, if that goes through and, um, you know, they are able to have synergies and, you know, it, it's ultimately increases the earning for Transjam, it will be a good one for them. And, you know, I mean, the product, it's, everybody uses it in elastic in demand, things like that. The, you know, like I think the dividend is like six percent. You know, like the dividend yield. Um, it's pretty. It's it's at the top with with you know the carreras and the SVL. I mean, right now in the context of higher interest rates, you know, the overnight policy rate is six six fifty. Um, so call it the interest rates are more attractive. But you know, once though things revert and you know interest rates go down, as you know, central banks will probably inevitably try to stimulate um economic activity then that will increase the attractiveness of um trans jams dividend you see, you see me knocking on wood andre right. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, we don't know when but eventually what goes up must come down but we don't know when don't 
Yeah, it's a cycle. It's just a cycle. It's just the way it is. Yeah, it's a cycle. But actually, it's, I think it's a good one. Very liquid stuff. Yeah, I, I really think their dividend can be better as well, as I said. Um, I think because of their their model and, and, and the simplicity of their, their business, I mean, like it's literally a dividend stock. It's not one that you necessarily look for great growth, even though I think there's opportunity yeah. for growth. Um, to me, if it grows, maybe um, let's say it grows 50% in the next six months for argument's sake. I'm not going to expect much further than that, which is why for me, I think the dividends are where they can compensate their shareholders. I right. think they're, they're, they're pretty much um, highly leveraged, meaning a lot of debt on the balance sheet. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, well, I guess one could argue that, you know, they want to kind of have cash because I, I believe they have they have restricted cash. So not mm-hmm. all the cash is theirs. So you know, it's the what left that they can distribute. And yeah, but so, I, I, I definitely agree. I mean, you know, the nature of their business, they should it's good for one that, 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 that is the definition of a dividend stock like you, you don't buy that company really for anything else um i mean so the point that Tron is making here in the chat is so most of the money goes to the top 10 shareholders so why not pay myself and an additional couple millions if i can who cares about my minority shareholders so the first part of, of Tron's comment is what so for me, the current low dividends will still benefit the top shareholders. Because if you pay a 10 cent dividend, for example, and you have 500 million shares, you get, what, $50 million. But if I have you know, 50,000 shares, I'm getting $500. <laughs> so so there, there's, there's a difference there. Um, so yeah, let's, let's continue though. So Trans Jamaica. Your thoughts, Julian, Jodian. So with trans, I think that it is something that is attractive not just because of the the, the, the potential for price growth in the future or the dividend, but just the fact that there is a scarcity of infrastructure assets that are listed. You don't have many opportunities like that currently. There is just weak time and trans pretty much and that shows the maturity of the market it's just it's just good to see the fact that we can have a conversation about investing in a highway you know yeah you yeah. pay a toll you might as well get back some dividends out of it right so i just think it's a good thing i don't have much else to say about it um other other than other than i think their ownership structure influences some of their decisions in that when you have ncb and jmb in your top 10 shareholders right they're not really going to have mercy as it relates to toll hikes because now it's an investment opportunity as opposed to just a public good because we we understand roads as public goods but within the context of our infrastructure investment it's going to be a little different because you know, pension funds have their liabilities to fund. Yeah. So, you know, that's the other side of the coin. But yeah, yeah. I think it's a good opportunity, without a doubt. Yeah. I think at least at these current prices, it, it's definitely a good opportunity. Current price. Oh, 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 one more thing. I remember there was a debate on Twitter about um, using PE to, 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 to value trends. And I think assets like trans, they carry a very heavy depreciation charge, right? Because they're, they're because of the nature of it. You know, it's very asset heavy. And when you mark down those assets over time to depreciation, it's going to have, it's going to de-emphasize the real value that is being generated. So it's important to, to juxtapose the cash that it generates, the cash flow from operations with net income, because net income is going to be small due to the big depreciation charge. So for an okay. asset like that, you definitely want to pay attention to your cash metrics. You want to look at your EV to EBITDA, you want to look at a DDM or whatever cash metrics that you use um, to try and have a, a more descriptive 
way of valuing the asset because it's not like a not like i was saying like a trading company it's an infrastructure asset so the depreciation right now is going to be big which is going to make net earth, net income smaller than it would um than it would necessarily communicate to investors so in other words the real investor value isn't being told by net income by itself the real value is how much cash is it generating and your valuation should match that okay yo german deep in thought you know <laughs> Like him just get yeah, the man, man, <laughs> me off. I said, I said, I just said that PE doesn't tell the full story because of the yeah, yeah, man, yeah, yeah, man, yeah. Cost me off, yo. What you mean? What you mean? How that mean? Wait, wait, wait. But everything is a matter of context. the best for every and in every sector. Yeah, PE has its has its limitations, you know. And then you also want to compare your PE with limitations. Yeah. So you always want to compare comparison with peers. So even though we compare with the general market, I mean that's just probably your first step. Um, you still want to do that comparison with peers. So if it is that you're looking at a manufacturing company, you want to compare those margins with other manufacturing companies. Um, yeah. So, you know, even though if it is that you we're, want to include that. Trends. Yeah. Trends. Yeah, we're I mean, that's, that, that, that's even, even that is tricky, which is why I brought up the cash flow um, related metric. You yeah, know, you know, so like with some stocks, it's useful to employ, you know, different type of multiples. So, maybe in in the case of trans um you know the price to free cash flow or um you know different metrics um I, I believe when it listed the approach that the the arrangers used was um the um discounted cash flow so that was the valuation that they they would have used but you know i think our market i mean even i don't even think it's really our market alone but most markets you know at the end of the day they seem to focus on PE. So I believe you just have to employ a, a variety of the different um, valuation metrics mm -hmm. and factor it in, into your overall valuation and use it to guide you. Because, I mean, if the broader market, you know, for example, what if you have a short-term investment horizon, um, the broader market is using, is using the PE ratio. And you say, all right, let me mark, mark it going right. You say, let me go left and just solely rely on like a price to ca um, free cash flow or Price book or something like that. You might have two different valuations, and then at the end of the day, you want the stock price to go up. And if 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 there's a disconnect in terms of the valuation, then you know it, it might move against you. So that's why I think it's best to employ you know like a variety of valuations, and from there you just use it to guide you. Yeah. yeah. So, so so two things from the chat. So blue collar finance mentioning um a question to Julian. Are you saying depreciation is not a real expense and should be adjusted for? I I wouldn't go as far as saying that it is not a real expense. I would say, given the context that it it's going to be so much bigger within the context of the, the type asset of, type, yeah. right? Because think about it. You have a lot of machinery. You have a lot of... Um, signage you have a lot of things that can be written down there's a lot of electronic assets that depreciate fast you have a lot of computers and stuff like that it's just very asset heavy as a matter of fact it's one of the most it's, it's basically the most asset heavy you can get so when you start writing that down for depreciation it just it can de-emphasize the story that profit would normally tell about another type of asset Right, yeah, so man, I'm man, just man. saying that earnings might not tell the full story, but I wouldn't say depreciation is not a real expense. It really depends on the type of um, the type of company, right? Because, um, for example, technology you have to treat technology differently, because in one case you might say, okay, um, what is the tangible book value? A lot of your, a lot of the things that generate cash in a tech company is not tangible because it's technology based. And your intellectual property, your licenses, your, your, a lot of things like that that can't necessarily be valued the same way as a tractor or a factory. They still tell a real story about the business ability to generate cash. So everything is a matter of context and it's really company based. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which is why more so we should contextualize profit with operating cash flows. They should really be looked at side by side to say, okay, what is the quality of earnings? How much is earnings made up of? 
how much of earnings is made up of actual cash? How much of it is made up of non-cash items? You really should look at that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so two other comments here that I think is 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 relevant to what we're talking about. Try and saying, doesn't PE speak to past performance? How then do I value future performance? Or yeah. future <laughs> expected performance? Oh boy. So what we're saying is that earnings in a vacuum doesn't always tell the full story it depends on the type of asset so when you look at the when you look at your your um your income statement you have to look at the expense items and understand what expense items are eating up earnings so you'll, you'll see that on the cash flow statement and if the distance between operating cash flows and net income is huge it therefore means that all the story is, might not necessarily be told by earnings. So using earnings in that case as a valuation method might not be reflective of what the asset is actually doing because the basis of it, which is earnings, is not telling the full story. So PE is not the be-all and end-all. I'm sorry, guys. It's not. Um, it's not, guys. All right. Okay, so Jodian, did you have any thoughts about Trans Jamaica before we move to? Oh, um, not really. I'm um, just that I think it's it's one of those that you should, um, just and uh, you know you want to you know add some amount of diversification to your portfolio. It is be a good addition. Um, when it is that you look at what's available, um, in the landscape or the local market, um, I think that there are definitely upside, um, for the company in terms of overall, um, reopening and where we see things going. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of more people, you know, moving out and getting out and about. Um, so there's that sort of upside for it. Um, I think in terms of their payout, I know um, Andrea had mentioned something about the restricted cash. Um, you know, it's just that they do sometimes, you know, in relation to, I think they have a pressure or some sort of debt um, that, you know, they may have, you know, some covenants. And so the ability to pay out may be, you know, limited based on other covenants that they may have to meet. And so they may not be able to do as much at all times. Um, but it would definitely be something that has some amount of upside potential. Okay. Try and saying we didn't answer his question about uh, about about um, valuing future expected performance. Try and re rephrase the question for us and we'll get and uh, we'll we'll get to it um, mm -hmm. for the for the next round. I guess mm -hmm. Jeremy just to address his question. <laughs> I think he, he he was saying that you know PE is um historic performance. So I mean mm -hmm. you have different type of PE and you, know, you have the trillion and then you have forward PE. I think in valuation, what's useful sometimes is to you know engage in forecasting. You're guided by the historical um performance, the you know the, the sector as a whole, any outlook that's on the horizon, and it's useful to project what you think earnings will be, you know, for maybe the next quarter or the next 12 months, or if you can go further beyond. Yeah. And inform that you can get a forward PE ratio, and then you use that to guide your, in terms of your um your relative valuation, you compare that forward PE ratio to that of peers, and see all right, based on where this company is heading. At the end of the day, it's forecasting. You know, you're not, you're not, you don't have a crystal ball, or you, you you probably won't have as much accuracy. But that is you compare that forward PE to um that of the peers and say all right this is where the, the company will be valued at this point in time based on its current price is it a buy yeah okay all right all right so next next round so one more pick each um so what we'll do we'll try to speed it up um in terms of feedback so let's do um maybe try to do about five to eight minutes max per per pick so we can at least get through the next round and then we can you know say, say any questions or comments that we have from there all right so julian since you went first you can share your second one now all right so my since jody actually mentioned the, the second one that i was going to mention um uh, another one i, I have is the lab Right, the lab has return on equity that is just shy of 30% as well. Um, it's down 29.7% from the 52 week high, and it's down 26.65% year to date. 
and the PE is about 17 times, just below 17 times, about 16.8. So in terms of the lab, they control the entire um, process of producing an advertisement. So they take it from start and they, and, and they take it right to the finish line. So anything as it relates to advertising, um, the lab opposite, um, offers it. So it's a full yeah. production powerhouse. So normally you have some companies that takes on one specific task or two, but they offer the full gamut. That's number one. Number two, it's led by a CEO that has been in that space for several years. So there's expertise, there's track record, they have very large contracts. You're talking about NCB, you're talking about KFC, the large, the largest players in the private private sector in Jamaica mm. um, are among their clients. So you're talking yeah. about good contract size. Um, they have different departments that they run. So each business arm complements the other. For example, when they go into a new area like um like their their influencer business that they just started recently scope caribbean scope it actually feeds into the rest of the business model so they're not going off on a tangent so it's a business that is really deepening their footprint as it relates to their value chain and as they expand their value chain they can then better manage their margins and continue to produce quality earnings from the standpoint of, of margins. So the other thing with the lab is that they earn additional income from renting out their equipment. So uh, as I uh, mentioned, the smaller agencies that might not necessarily be able to do what they do, um, meaning that they might not have the, they might not own the equipment that they know how to use, they can rent it out and earn income from that standpoint. So it's a full production house and they have persons who are experts who um, work in-house and it's a business that definitely has a strong traje trajectory as it relates to the Christmas season because as we know if companies are expected to see strong seasonal growth they will have strong marketing campaigns to capitalize on the post-COVID boom as it relates to the Christmas season the first post-COVID Christmas you should see a lot of offers come into market especially in a climate where consumers are watching price so closely. So that yeah. should drive vo add volumes for the business. So I think lab stands to benefit significantly. And it's a business that is well positioned for the future because of the things that were mentioned earlier. Uh, my concern for them, so I actually did the stock review for them last week. So I actually had a chance to look at them. Uh, my concern for them is, is based on the the specialized nature of the business, because you just said it, I figure they have a lot of, you know, specialists that, that, that type of service tends to be costly in terms of resources that you use. So my concern is as they grow, as they expand those rising admin costs, you know, salaries, etc. you know, if they can manage that, then they can, you know, continue to grow. But that's, that's the part that I'm, I'm concerned with for them, but I do like the company um i'm just not sure they'll be able to 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 grow the same if they're not able to manage um expense as well well the, the the thing is while their their talent will be expensive from that perspective given that they rely on specialist talent they can always price it back to their customers because remember their customers are actually the, the entities that can afford that kind of service. So that's number one, they can generally pass it through in their contracts. And number two, given that they are uniquely positioned because they have all those relationships with the large entities, if it is that they lose someone by means of them going to another firm or going off on their own, then they can, just from a standpoint of probability, they can bring somebody else, train them up, and continue the machinery that they have because their real selling point is how all of these different parts come together yeah. and taking the production from start to finish which 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 is really and truly their selling point the fact that they can do um do it from blueprint stage 
to the end product, post-production, the pretty ad that we see when we watch the movies, all of those things. Um, okay. It's really the fact that they are controlling the entire value chain from start to finish. That's really hard to replicate. Yeah. They shout out to Greg. Yo, Greg is my OG. Salute. Yeah. Any thoughts on, on the lab, guys, Jody and Andre? Uh, yeah, so just to be quick, I think um, just a lesson learning um, process with um, the lab and their acquisition, I think the buying to scope um, is that I think a lot of times we think acquisition and we think, oh, they're going to buy something stable and we just going to shoot up and, you know, everything going with Chris and Kirk going forward. But I think what it presents is that you see companies or you see a company buying into something that has growth potential. So it is allowing you as an investor to invest in one company with that sort of strong possibility for upside um, should scope, you know, realize probably its full potential. So it's just another twist on how it is that sometimes acquisitions happen. They don't necessarily always be buying strong and, you know, great things, uh, but also buying in at a younger stage for development um, in some ways. Yeah. I mean, scope, scope um, had a loss. For the last i think the last quarter 2.5 million dollar loss so we'll see how it how it progresses um, yeah it's a startup so yeah. it will come around it should it should yeah so you get a little venture capitalist kind of vibe yeah, coming in when yeah, you're buying yeah, into yeah. lab right yeah man first yeah. part of the j curve Re retail investors in in jamaica not really a fan of startups you know but we'll see we'll see no, don't mind me, don't mind me. Don't, don't yeah, respond. I was going to just leave it blank. Don't respond, yeah. don't respond to that, don't respond to that. Andre, any thoughts on the lab? Yeah, lab. Um, so, yeah, pretty much what Julian was saying is, you know, the whole advertising process, you know, there from start to finish. So, you know, call it vertical integration, Um, especially with, you know, them bringing scope on board. Um. They seem to dominate the space within which they operate, especially with, you know, they have a lot of corporate clientele. I guess my only concern would be, you know, if, for example, a Grace Kennedy accounts for the bulk of their earning and, and then, you know, should Grace Kennedy say, all right, we slash our marketing budget in half, that would probably take a hit on the are that would somewhat affect their earnings. Um, but outside of that, I think it's, it's pretty much a good company and by and large, they're earnings have been you know above surface and they've been doing well yeah okay yeah. all right next one um who's up i think next was andre yes yeah, so my next one would be one that i've always watched and I, I, I don't remember if i discussed it last time but it's purity um you know for the most part purity i wish chike was here right now because that's that's what a chike speaks yeah, question. Did, did we discuss purity last time? No, 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 we didn't. Okay, so I've I've always been watching purity because what I've noticed is that it it's for the most part has always been trading at a relatively deep discount to its book value. Um, you know, you know, maybe the market it's been a loss maker, so that could probably be by and part of the reason as to why the, the market has it been so oversold. But if you look at the last two quarters. I believe they did 16 million for the March quarter and probably a 13 million for the um for the June quarter. So that's two consecutive quarters of profitability. You know, it could have been some spillovers from the Easter season. Um Purity is a brand that should be known to you know most Jamaicans. Um I so, don't know that it's listed. Yeah, the, well, I mean, if if you work off of the, the name Consolidated Breakers, but you know the tick of purity, um, and I actually I always I always like to you know encourage people to buy products that they are a fan of. I yeah. purity is like one of my favorite Easter ones. I think they them them up there. So when I taste the product, I think the product's good. So obviously it reflected in their earnings where they did well for that March and June quarter. Where as I said, I think earnings. I mean, Easter was around April. So, you know, people would have been buying up to April, up to the end of March, which would have been the quarter end. And then, you know, when that passed, people would have probably still been buying and then that would have probably flowed to the June numbers. So um, that probably would have contributed to the, the increase in earnings going forward. 
the um earnings that we've seen so far so i'm watching because i want to see if they can maintain this trajectory of profitability um with respect to the balance sheet i believe the balance sheet is is somewhat stable um I believe the debt to equity is around 23 times. It's fairly liquid. Current ratio of 1.6 times. Um, the, on a, for the for the last quarter, the um the gross profit margin was around 42 percent, and that would have compared to was 38 percent in 20, for the same period in 2021, as well as 38 percent for the previous quarter. So it's an improvement in the gross profit margin on a period of a period of a year over year basis, as well as on a quarter over quarter basis. So um the price has been doing well so far um it's, it's up almost, almost 120 percent year to date yes it is and it actually has a small float i mean you know pretty much when companies have small float once there's an uptick in demand and you know there's limited supply i mean in the top 10 holes the bulk of the shares and you know not really inclined to sell some investors will just be obliged to just buy it at whatever price they can get and that will push the stock up so by and part, as I said, you know, the earnings seems to have um, done well for them where investor sentiment towards them has, has gone up. And funny enough, at at current prices, it's it's still below book value. So let's continue to watch that one. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Julian, Julian. Boy. Yeah, it's not one that I've been looking at, so I don't really have much. I don't know what to say. I'll, I'll know. Well, it, it, I'll know. Be looking at it. I'll know. Be looking at it. Now that Andrew has Jordan. mentioned, but it's not what I've looked at. One, one, thing, one thing I must add though, before before you answer, Julian, is I'm still aware of all the competitors in this space. You have your national. You have your um your honey bun, and all of those other guys. So they're they're up against some big players, but. You know, whatever they've been doing right for the last few quarters, we can just continue it and you know, kind of chug away at some little market share. You see, was it actually be a target for an acquisition? Who knows? So, so all right, use that word, <laughs> yeah. So, so all right, so here's what I think is good about Creator, right? Creator has been around for a very long time, I think they've been around for over 50 years, right? Their family business. And typically, family businesses, they tend to be invested in the asset, meaning that there's some level of commitment. So in theory, they would want to see it continue as a going concern. So they also have products that actually have strong brand equity, like Miss Birdie. There are people who have Miss Birdie crackers or Miss Birdie um, cornbread. I used to eat Miss Birdie cornbread. So the, all of those things are what's good about purity. But for some reason, I don't know what it is, they just cannot contain their expenses. I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's like the expenses, you know when you know when the dog just bust off a leash and the dog just gone both in business? I don't understand. <laughs> but I see what you see regarding the last couple of quarters. Mm -hmm. Um I want I want purity to win. Um and I just can't understand how is it that people who know the business, um, a brand that's a household name, they sell something simple. I'm not saying it's easy because it's very competitive, but something simple. Bread, bread products, baked products, Jamaicans love these things. How is it that they just can't get it right? I don't understand. So I don't know. I'm, I'm watching on the sidelines too. But I have an issue with the liability management. They need to get it right. Trust me, it's like a more extreme version of what I was saying about brothers. You need to see that. I remember when interest rates going up, you know, um, if you're if you can't if you're EBIT that to interest, if you can't comfortably if you can't comfortably cover your debt, and interest rates start going up, the interest cost going go up by much more, not by a little bit. So if they in other words for them to do well in an environment with rising interest rates they have to continue on the track they have started on for this financial year so that's what i'm saying andre they cannot afford to fall off yeah but i just looked at it i noticed that they have a big jump in that finance cost 
that June quarter, then the the specialized week. Yo, what's the meme with the African youth? <laughs> But then funny, as I said, Jody, as you notice, you know, the interest cost jump from two million, yeah. seven million, big jump. But then Huge. profit. Triple. Profit. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. If it is that they did some expansion, or just some refinancing. Yes, I mean higher debt, higher debt. Yeah. Yeah, I mean normally that thing one would have been waiting for them to produce these numbers when interest rates were low, but the man the numbers gone good when interest rates yes. higher and yes, then find out the interest rates are off. <laughs> so then say yeah, <laughs> you call him, is you call him Andre? I'm pressure so means of unlending. Yeah, them say crunch time. Yeah. 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 I mean I'll check them out as well. I, I, I don't know much about them, but as I said, Chike was talking about it um a few yeah. months ago actually. So um I'll, I'll write it down. Very, very yeah. happy to hear. Um so what, we'll oh one them. thing to credit them with though, Jermaine they've been doing a decent amount of capex they have been investing in their their productive capacity i'm not sure if it is that they're replacing old machinery or whatever but the last time i looked they were doing quite a bit of capex that's good because yeah. businesses like that they have to maintain a certain amount of capex to be efficient because if you have the old machines and they're not being replaced then your output your asset turnover is gonna fall and it leads to other issues so that's yeah. good that's a good sign and that could be because of that could be a part of why they're they're actually more profitable now maybe it is that they're more efficient and their asset turnover yeah. is higher and they can just do more volume maybe that's what it is you know they can hit their break even rate faster but i'm not i'm not i'm not convinced yet but my fingers are crossed because mm. we, you know we need to see them win the more profitable yeah. companies, the more opportunities for all of us. So, I'll, I'll definitely look at them. As I said, I think Chike mentioned it. I never, um, I wasn't interested, but let's see. I agree so, with what Greg just said, though. Yeah, he said they have yeah. more brand value than performance. So, yeah. the acquisition would be interesting, definitely. I'm sure anyone that would want to, it's a family run business and you know, it's trading um, steep discount based on multiples. So, you know, anyone that would want to do an acquisition of a company would likely pay a premium relative to the market price so you yeah. know it, yeah it, that, it would be interesting that it. news would definitely send things flying <laughs> all right yeah definitely one, all right one, so one bit, of, mm -hmm. one bit of courage on Jeremy. i think i said the, the debt to equity was 23 times but it's actually it's a little bit higher but not that much higher it's actually 42 time so basically 40 percent of the capital. okay 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 all right so um final pick for jody oh okay sure so i think um in speaking in the vein of how i spoke about the sinko in that a company that has cash um and the usage of cash um so i went a bit on the very far end and so my junior market one for me that i am um, looking at is blue power i think they took their hit um they're big hits. I know that there was the, the impact of CARICOM um, that would have had some impact on them. I think prior to, I think they have recently um, did some acquisition. So I know they bought something, um, some lands and space um, within the neighboring vicinity. And so they were able to, I guess, in some ways use cash. They also, did, they also sold something. Um, so they did sell some the land um, to Lumber um so i think that one in the ability to having that cash and being able to use it um for possible opportunities another thing i like um or that i am watching with blue power is the management um in terms of the minds that are around that company in terms of chairman um as well as the I know that their, their previous um md would have retired and said so i got a new one and then you know they would have moved up um, the young guy who was in charge of their commercial operations so i think that space is one that um i am watching so i think that is my pick that is very far left um from what i are far center from what i'm used to that sort of conservative um but just that they would have taken their hit and then they were able to deploy some of their cash um to to make some moves so we want to see i'd want to see how it is that that move plays out for them okay okay um all right any any other thoughts guys 
I think the main opportunity now is positioning for the Christmas trade. So I would have shared two of mine. My third was one that Jody shared, which is Wisinko. So Wisinko, the lab, and also Fontano. But there are a couple more out there. And I think investors should think creatively. So for example, AMG packaging, um, by virtue of them being a packaging business and goods turnover is expected to be higher um, in the Christmas season, it could feed back into higher revenues for AMG packaging. Um, you know, just by virtue of it, you know, being what it is. And they're going to need more boxes to move more products. And yeah, that's another one. Just have to think outside the box. So what I did there? The box, <laughs> AMG. Oh yeah, man, man, I could do this all day. <laughs> yeah. Um okay, AMG is interesting. Um I mean for me, I'd probably say so. I like I mean I've I've, I've 23 years with an IT background, right? Um so I do like technology companies. And I was trying to, to decide, right? Because there, there are a couple of them. Um, I really do like so normally for stocks to watch, we don't like to mention you know IPOs. Um, because I, I have the, the perspective that companies plan and prepare to list. So the first six to twelve months after listing, I think is gonna look very nice and rosy. It's gonna seem all wonderful, like just like this upward trend and then after that we may not see two three years down the line the same sort of you know aggressive or or um intentional growth so um the last one for me or the second one for me rather um is so i'm trying to decide which one right because i like two companies i'm just trying to decide which one i like more um so I do think there is there's potential. Okay. So if I had to choose one, I'd probably pick one on one, right? And the reason why I would do that is because of how they would be invested in, in terms of their, their technology and infrastructure. I think they've kind of laid the groundwork for a long time, right? So um, growing and scaling should be a lot easier um but i mean at the same time i do like um i just think i just think a lot of things can can go well for them especially within the next six to nine months i'll i'll say that um but i'm not going to actually want to take back that one because as i said i don't like to generally use ipos that are within their first year right so instead, I'll actually say I like a company that used to be a fan favorite or a community favorite and has fallen off in terms of their, their, their good graces, and that's Cygnus. Um, I think Cygnus, uh, I mean, they would have had some a, a rough stretch. I think, I think they're, they're going to, you know, they have to write off a very... Um, there was a company in Cayman that, that, that I don't remember how to explain it right now. Um, and I think they've, they've they've already you know decided to 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 record that loss. They're still trying to to recover those funds. If they're able to great, if not, they're kind of you know they've booked it and now they can move past it. So I think they have some some opportunities there. I do not. Um, I think they, they the expectations are a little bit more sober than they used to be, meaning as a lot more bullish on the company previously than I am now, but I still think that there are opportunities based on where it is. So so I believe in general that the perspective and outlook for companies change depending on where they are currently, meaning as you get new information, your outlook will change. So maybe in the next few months, I'll feel differently, but I think that's a, a good one there for me. Um, in terms of a watch list, but I really like one, as I said, uh, I really think there, there are opportunities for both them and learn actually 
Um, I understand both companies well. As I, as I said, um, we're we're in um, education as Learn Grow Invest, so I understand education. Um, I'm 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 23 years in tech, so I understand technology and the things that that come come with it. Um, so yeah, any any thoughts from you guys? Well, I guess I thought, oh, go ahead, Andre. Okay, so, we're, so, so we're talking about Cygnus, right? I was just kind of... Yes, yes. I was okay. going to comment on Cygnus. Um, so I think one of the things for Cygnus is that they, they do operate um, in somewhat of a, a, a niche in a way in terms of the type of financing that they offer. And yeah. so in a period such as this, um, there could be more demand for those sorts of companies seeking financing. Uh, I think the... the the challenge also is that um, because we're in a high interest rate environment and the market space that we cater to may be one that is really avoiding, um, you know, some sort of more debt financing in this period of time. So, I mean, when you look at the clientele that they would be normally servicing, um, it would be more companies that are even in a low interest rate environment would have to be paying a nicer premium. And so if you're in a high interest rate environment, um, that premium for those sort of companies, you know, become a, a little bit heavy. Um, and so on that side of it, it may be difficult um, to take on some of that sort of risk with those companies. Um, yeah. in terms I mean, of, it's still 50%. Yeah. From 29. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just in terms Thank of the outlook for so. the current markets, where we're going, um, in terms of the type of companies that they would normally be... Um, see getting financing for um so yes you know those companies in this period of time may be in need of financing but also based on the nature of those companies um you know the premium um in an already high interest rate market can be very um can be very heavy on those type of companies and so it's how it is that you then go to management and rationalize that risk to take it on um would be the tough thing that i think in about signals yeah. So Robert asking me um, if I'm if I'm well. Um, Robert in the chat, but I mean, you know, referring to the to, to the dilution currently. I mean, it. I still we saw we saw recently where one company. Um, well, for one, Cygnus did mention a share buyback plan um, at their last um, meeting there. So we will hear more about that, but I mean, shares shares can be bought back. I mean, we've seen that um, be be enacted for some companies. So um, I mean, it's 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 a stock to watch for for various reasons, right? Andre Julian, Andre is like no, not a fan of that pick at all. Uh, so. Um... Cygnus, I think it, there's a lot of value there, and you know, I agree with Jody there operating a, in a little niche. And um, I think even now, when interest rates are high, they kind of offer some flexible um, financing that tends to come in the form of a mixture of both debt as well as equity. So, um, so basically, the whole alternative space right now is is um more attractive relative to the traditional stocks and bonds and things like that so that should that should flow to the bottom line with respect to the stock price um you know it's pretty much just been my observation at least in in current conditions you know somewhere the, the banks the investment companies the, the the guys in finance their stock tends to do best when um you know economic conditions are more favorable yes. Yes, yeah. I not agree. saying that yeah. it's affecting um Cygnus's performance though, but you know, just just in, in, in these times, uh, like as a, a sector as a whole, wouldn't 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 that make them attractive right now based on that fact? So yeah, one could argue that you know it's a buying opportunity, buying time for them, and, and so forth. But in in all honesty, Cygnus isn't really one that I actively um track, mm. you know um yeah yeah I, I, I don't remember what their ipo price was but i mean 12 12 70 down 13 percent i think your all-time high is around 28 dollars if i'm if i'm not mistaken so 
I mean, so I, I do agree. And I think that's why we're seeing companies like, you know, NCB down um, and a lot of the financial sector not doing as well as it was before 29, before the, the pandemic. I think when the general outlook is better, those, those, that sector will do much better, right? So that would be a sign to me that things are back to normal. That industry to me is the benchmark for that. Um, yeah. Any thoughts, Julia? Any any analogies that that, that is is appropriate here? Well, with 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 Cygnus, I just think that <clears throat> their best days are yet to come because their type of financing is rare in the Caribbean region. They have proven themselves to be a regional asset manager and not necessarily a, J a Jamaican company. So given the context of the pie still being small relative to its, there I go again with analogies, right? The pie being small relative to its potential, um, we definitely should see significant um, growth in the future as it relates to their balance sheet, meaning the NAV, um, the size of the, the, the opportunity should just grow exponentially as more companies look for alternative types of financing. Their, their best days are ahead of them. So in other words, I expect even more growth in the next five years because of yeah. that fact. I mean, I, I really do think that so in general, no, this is us. So, so we've kind of given our picks now, right? So it's general thought now. For me, I think it's it's not easy to buy a company when it's down 40 50 percent especially if you're holding before the pandemic but if you have the cash if you have the patience then to me these are the times you take advantage of certain opportunities right because for me i think buying companies at a premium which a lot of them were in 2019 at a premium i thought um it didn't make sense to be buying companies at really high prices, right? Because back then, I, I literally felt like you could just pick a company out of a hat, hold it for three months, and you'd be up 30, 40 percent, right? That, that's what it felt like in 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 twenty nineteen. Anyway, yeah. yeah. So during these times, I think you have opportunity to build volume in certain types of companies, and that volume you'll see now really good growth when things recover right so it's not nice to buy a company when it's going down and the outlook is bearish and it's not doing well and it this and it that and it that but two years from now if it's back to where it was pre-pandemic you'll be like man i missed the boat <laughs> that is kind of sometimes how it is because nobody wants to buy a company and see it go down but to me i like to own companies that i can get healthy dividends meaning not just the amount of dividend, but volume. And Cygnus, I think, pays, I mean, no no dividend is high enough for me. I think you guys know that. But uh, they've, they've paid um, reasonable dividends in the past. And I think that when things recover, which at some point you kind of expect them to, to be having good volume in a company like that would be a good, a good play. So. Agreed. All right, so I wanted us to take one pick from the community and kind of just talk about the company. Um, something interesting that I saw. So I'll just bring up some some comments here. I'll just say, um, I think Malik is the name. Spur Tree was actually, um, we, 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 we interviewed the CEO on Monday. I think, I think if you watch that interview, you'll understand that. I think the acquisition will bode well for them. I think we'll see um, good things from them in, in the next few months. I don't know if you guys have any comments or thoughts on, on Spur Tree. You can take one or two. So I just think that it goes back to what we mentioned earlier about more Jamaicans being outside of Jamaica than here in, yeah. in the country. So that speaks to the total addressable market because the appetite for Jamaican products and services would remain the same, even though these people would have migrated. And again, if it's consumed within a family setting, it expands the market reach because not only 
do the parents become consumers, but the children will then acquire a taste for these products and expand the market in the further. So I just think that companies like Spiritry that position externally, they have a fantastic opportunity. I still think it's under tapped within the context of Jamaica. I am I'm really baffled. I mean, when you look at the the numbers, you look at the the, the chances that we have to succeed internationally, especially as it relates to food, something non-technical, you know, it's a no-brainer. So I think spiritually among others have yeah. a very strong trajectory there. In in general, so um, I think that, um, so I think, so I'll ask you guys this as we kind of prepare to close here. A lot of persons would have seen their their portfolios kind of take a hit, especially if you are investing for the long term. Um, the question that I get a lot, or persons, you know, kind of ask me about, you know, I'm down thirty percent, forty percent. What do I do? Do I do I keep holding, or I may have, or I may other companies in my portfolio may be doing well, but there's this one that, you know, I really like. I'm holding on to hoping that something will change, right? Um, what would you say to persons, right? So we're not getting into any specific companies. This is more like a portfolio management strategy um, to, to, to talk about here where, so what I said to, to, to persons in that case is that you have to first understand the company, understand what would have went into the company, maybe not doing as well as it was before, uh, because we have seen companies grow in the pandemic so it's not just the pandemic right um and then you have to kind of determine where that company is likely to be maybe in six months or a year from now to determine whether or not you should still hold or maybe it's better to take a last invest it otherwise and then maybe re-enter a position down the line right i shared this on on, on the channel before that i took a loss in a big financial institution to move to another opportunity which worked out and that institution went down another 30 40 percent since i sold so if i waited then things would have just that would have taken a big hit so i think that it's important to understand your timing so if it is that you have again as i said if you have cash and you have time then maybe you can wait it out just average down but if you don't have cash or time you may want to take a loss any thoughts on that yeah. well, i guess what i'd say is is sometimes it depends um is it um that, that something has fundamentally changed about the company so is it that you bought into something and then you know the reason for the dip is really because there's some sort of fundamental change in that company um is it that market sentiment has changed i think somebody mentioned in the chat um, that market sentiment does play a part um, in how things operate. So is it that you had a two-year horizon or you had a short term, a shorter horizon and market sentiment shift, um, then, you know, you could probably consider um, exiting. Um, if it is that, you know, there may not have been a material change um, in the fundamentals of the company um, and you are not in necessarily need of cash or you're not particularly keen on actively trading or taking it and you know doing it to something to re-enter then you can probably just ride the wave so it really depends on you as the individual um and you know your goals and your outcomes and so you'd have to balance all of that into one package but if it is a company that things have turned you know for the negative because of something operational um then you know if you're just really hopes and dreams on it then i'd say take a loss and go ahead but if it is that there's not necessarily a fundamental change um then you know your, your options may be different. You may sell sell down a bit, or you can buy somewhere and average down. Um, but definitely, if it is that you know the company um, is showing that you know things are definitely not going well, um, then you would always want to exit and just take a loss. You know, not necessarily hold on to you know I am fingers crossed, hoping something will change. Yeah. Um, Especially in in a market where companies don't share an abundance of information. So the company has been heading down. You don't know what their plans are. You don't know what's what's gonna. You just you literally only have the financials to look at, 
to tell you the story of the company. And and the MDNA doesn't always give you much either. Um, so yeah. Yeah, so I just chime in here to say investors have to this this really highlights the importance of knowing what you're buying and why you're buying what you're buying because that that can make a huge difference so for example while a discussion about the lab and you share the perspective related to scope given that scope is losing money but because i understand that scope is a startup and the startups typically lose money before they hit their break-even point and then they start to scale out and grow revenues and profitability very quickly you know it it, it allows us to manage our expectations and to put yeah. returns into context and context matters so for instance we find that the mdna might be scanty which is unfortunate but the company might go at length in an article i yes. don't understand it i find that so interesting i don't understand it it's like they don't know the purpose of the mdna mm -hmm. so mdna oh revenue up profit down we we bought this asset we, it's we, doing we, well we we have a positive outlook on the future all the best <laughs> signature <laughs> and then david will interview them and then tell them life story how them going to do this next year and this is the branch and i'm like boss this is what you're supposed to say in the mdna yeah so that's why we say that investors need to know what they're buying you have to track your companies you have to read the newspaper because you don't know yeah, what's going to be in the papers interviews and all that stuff you know, watch learn go invest interviews and interviews from um yeah. others in the community as well to, to, yeah, to and know I think just to add Julia, the AGMs are good to attend as well. Um, I know yeah. that there are online. Um, I think it makes that a little bit easier for, for some the ones of us. That are available, Jody, and for the ones yeah. that are available. That's why I say some of them are online and you know they require your JCSD number. So I mean as a shareholder, you know, you can hop on and you know ask the questions. Um, you know. Yeah. I mean, so try and is asking a question. And here, I know you haven't chimed in yet, Andre, but Trian is asking, if the company is not in line with my goal, what do I do? My goal is for money. <laughs> I want X money by X time. What, what are some things to consider? Oh, so I, right. well, to generally address um, the point that you're saying, um, my, my, my view probably pretty much um, is in line with Jody and Zone. Like right now in, in the current environment, you know, across the board stocks have been falling off so i mean you have your portfolio of equities um you know the way how i the approach that i would employ is to you know look at the ones that their performance has been favorable but you know the prices have been falling off do i expect them to continue um on a positive trajectory factoring in you know all the uncertainties in the in the current environment and then no, I would want to separate those from the ones that you know just not really performing fundamentally. Some would have been impacted, you know, they, they, they've already been impacted by higher interest rates. You know, they probably have a high debt stock, or there's a, a broader slowdown in the sector within which they operate. And then you know you'd have some that just pretty much probably not being managed right, or they're just not getting it right. So you want to separate those. Two. I mean, for the ones that are you know solid fundamentally speaking at that point in time dollar cost averaging would be a useful strategy um you know for the other ones you know sometimes you, sometimes you kind of have to cut your losses but you want to do so um carefully it has to be carefully thought out and you know probably be done in phases you know, at times you want to understand how the stock trades um you know find out when is the best time when you when you think you could probably offload a portion of the stock you really have to look to go about dumping it especially if that stock makes up for a sizable portion of your overall portfolio things like that um yeah and by and large and i think my to me i'm i'm probably the you know probably you know with investing you know the, the long-term approach is, is a very useful one but in volatile markets sometimes it's good to employ different investing strategies you know um i subscribe to a newsletter and the author says you know 
in these kind of markets, they, these markets are meant to be rented, not owned. I mean, that's his personal opinion. At the end of the day, value you have a different investment types. So you have your, your long-term investor is the one that they value ones. But then sometimes, for example, Jeremy, I said, I think you said you separate your long-term um, portfolio from your short-term ones. So that could yeah. be something that you know you use to kind of offset the um, the, the losses on the core stocks that you have. Some of these stocks, if you can identify the, the, the patterns within which they trade, you can you know get some short-term gains that offset the the, the, the losses. Exactly. Exactly. Once. so the markets are very volatile you know prices will go up prices will go down you probably want to employ or start to employ a mixture of both long-term investors are investing as well as a little mm -hmm. short term the short term is tricky because you know broker fees can eat it out sometimes you, you get it wrong but if you it takes a lot of time a lot of effort if you can and not truly understand us all. you don't there's there's like a hundred stocks you don't have to understand how all of them trade you can stick to exactly i say four to six yeah four to six. Six. and Focus. then yeah and then when i do my short-term trading it's you mean you don't always get it right nobody's a psychic in the event that you know yes all right you're expecting uh, a 10 percent uptick over a very short period of time what if that 10 percent uptick never materializes the way how I address that is that I would mostly short-term trade stocks that I have no, I am fine holding for the long term. So that's that's pretty much an approach that one could, you know, go about looking to um, employ. Yeah. But every 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 asset class has its season. So as I said, right now it's the new issues, um, it's the new bond issues that that are doing good. Um, some of these bonds becoming so, you know, they're they're. They have some nice structures to it, you know. You have some. I saw one had a variable rate, variable rate component to the floor feature, you know. So pretty much, as long as interest rates are increasing, that increases the the, the, the coupon that that bond pays. But yeah. if it falls below a certain threshold, then, then the you still get that okay. that minimum threshold, and that threshold was a double digit number. So, as I said, right now. So mean meaning we could substitute the dividends that we're not getting for the bond. This is what you're saying? I mean, that's that's one. I mean, <laughs> yeah. To be honest, there's some, but I mean, we at the end of the day, you know, I believe equities is really. Yeah. You know, I, I'm 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 just equity. really starting to feel like dividend investing in Jamaica is not a thing. Because mm -hmm. if you're not like, I don't think again. I say it one last time, guys, bear with me. You cannot consider yourself a dividend stock if you're not paying more than 5%. You're not paying more than 5% dividend, just keep the money, reinvest in the business. I, <laughs> I won't say it again. I'll, I'll probably edit this stuff out. But I mean, I just I just think we should do better with dividends. But if bonds are double digits, we saw that the PBS preference share was double digits as well. I think for those looking for... Um, I mean, there's no risk-free investment. I think I think it's safe to say that. Um, I say it to persons because one of the things that persons do, I think, when the markets are like this, they withhold their investing. They don't invest at all. They'll keep their money um, in the bank and not take any risk, which is the biggest risk because your money is losing purchasing power. So things like preference shares um, that pay you know, more, more attractive rates could be something that you look at um, again, if it is that your focus is long term, getting the the ten point five percent, I think it was from the PBS preference share, at least is right where the inflation level is. So that may be something that you look at. But if you're holding a dividend stock at two percent and there are better opportunities out there, I think you should be um, a little bit more realistic in terms of how how your your investing i think in general you should what well, we advocate for persons right so we we will always say to persons well here at learn grow invest we are not financial advisors we're financial coaches so speak to your licensed financial you know advisor but you want to be able to understand what your advisor is telling you to do which is why we advocate for persons to learn the basics that's why we do things like this um because the main value you should take from a, a, a video like this is the reasons why we're looking at the company and not the company themselves. 
right? I uh, hope that that's what you guys are taking away from this. Um, and that will help you, you know, formulate your own watch list and understand what are some of the things to look for for your own portfolio, right? So taking a loss is personal, but don't not do anything actively to manage your portfolio, right? It, it's your money. It's your wealth. Nobody's going to care about it more than you. And you are the one with, with responsibilities, whether it be for yourself or for family, you know, X, Y, Z. So that's, that's what I'd say to that. Yeah, um, I think if I may comment, I think um, one of the questions um, in terms of making money in X time, I think probably what you just need to do is to set your own, you know, what you want for your, what's your return on investment. And so, you know, you just do more active trading in that space. Um, you're not necessarily somebody who is, um, you know, doing this sort of long-term sort of play. So you mm -hmm. probably just have to outline, you know, what is my return on investment. And then once it's not meeting that within a particular time frame and you allow your reassess and then you probably move on to if it is that you find a play that could give you um, that sort of return that you want um, in terms of a more active trading sort of position. And then somebody was saying that the buying um, for one of these bonds is like 10 mil. So I think most companies um, within the space offer some sort of fund um, that you know could give you some buy into buying into corporates indirectly through the fund. So you could probably consider that option. Yeah. All right. Um, Michael is also also asking about JFP. JFP is a very, very, very interesting company. I really think um, they have, I think if you understand the business model, you'll understand the potential value. That, that's all I'll, I'll, I'll say for them. Yeah, um, JFP, I know they, they, they've been doing well and that, that push for the US market, and I think they even recently secured a US contract that, that has done well for them with respect to the last set of earnings. Um, team seems to be aggressive in you know securing deals um not just locally but you know internationally mm -hmm. so um that's one to watch out for to see if they can maintain that performance and if it does you know it's a stable source of revenue given you know the contractual basis so exactly exactly yeah i think right. the, new, the new starbucks location should be to their benefit as well mm -hmm. yeah let, let me just touch um Sean Sean's question before we go. Um it's actually one of my stocks to watch, you know. Um but we don't have the time. But since Sean brought <laughs> <laughs> I'll be I'll be short, but you know that ace bride acquisition I see for the last quarter it 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 did a little bump in terms of um their profitability. And I believe correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think the full numbers was um factored in. Are there about but i'm not sure i'm not sure yeah it's, I, I, from, from i exited my my position last year i haven't looked at them but i mean i was holding from 23 dollars so i mean i was as happy with with my returns over the last few years but i haven't looked at them since looked at them yeah. since i sold yeah so i, I i'm just I'm, I'm watching they're on my watch list as well i want to mm -hmm. see how the, the, the um as brighton's earnings um incorporates with with separate zone and how the overall operation is improved. And then I'm also, you know, watching for that that listing on the on the main market as well as the eventual cross listing on the TTSC. So I might the, the, the cross listing concerns me, but we'll see. Yeah. Well yeah. yeah. I mean because you know in, investors will exploit those arbitrage opportunities. Mm -hmm. Um, if you can somehow position yourself to benefit from it, then you know that might give you a nice gain um, with respect to your, your short-term goals or things. Yeah, like that. yeah. Let's let's see. Okay. It's, it's all. all right. Uh, final question here. Michael is asking about an e-fresh outlook. Uh, I mean, seriously, I've, I've, everything I've, fresh. Absolutely fresh traumas. I don't. I don't have any comments. Come on, man. Come on, there are better opportunities out there. That's not even worth talking about. <laughs> Seriously. Uh, no. Hey, if, if Julian is being that way, um, any thoughts, Julian, on, on eFresh? 
as a medical health company, it's interesting to have you. Exactly, exactly. exactly. So I'm not sure. Um, I think, I think, yeah. I, I mean, I wasn't worried at IPO, and I haven't really. It's not one of those that I've looked back at since. I'm yeah. Not quite yeah. Uh, I'm not really seeing much for growth. Jody, 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 Jody. Sorry, I'm not coming. Jody. All right. The balance me. sheet. The balance sheet. The last time I looked at it, it was weak. In terms of being able to cut, all right. So the good thing is they've been able to grow revenues for a couple quarters, right? But they just cannot convert those revenues into profitability. They don't sell something technical. They sell something that has inelastic demand. They sell to hotels, no, sir, Andre. Yeah, man, to hotels. But isn't there e-fresh in another space? But all right, hold, one second. Let me let me address the everything first. Sorry to cut it. Yeah, go ahead. You see, teach me. You see teach some me. stocks. I don't really watch everything fresh, to be honest with you. Um, I find that some you stocks have you know, to do their time. <laughs> you see some stocks that are on the, the, the um the, a big turnaround. And you know, if, if those avid investors that are able to price in that turnaround before the, 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 the turnaround is actually announced, then that normally gives those returns, those investors, some like explosive returns. I mean, we've seen it happen, especially with CPJ. They were they was they, they had a the, the failure, the implementation of the IT platform back then, and then you know the tourism industry took a hit. Yes, and then, yeah, I, I remember like the market was pricing in a turnaround, and the stock price went up. I think I don't I know it's up wickedly on a year to day basis, especially with respect to the recent high. And then when they actually post that numbers, then it's like, you know, everything made sense. So just look, when I'm here looking at every everything fresh numbers, as I say, it's not really one that I'm bullish on. Um, I'm really taking a dive on the balance sheet. But with respect to the profitability, they seem similarly positioned um, as a as a purity. Um, on a year-to-date basis of the June, their profit was $37 million. You know compared to a loss of 23 million so um i think well, michael i think that could probably have been the reason why he asked given you know that turnaround in, in the operation and then you know the whole broader sentiment towards the tourism industry you know the, the, the rebounding of it that has contributed so much to the uptick in, in our gdp figures you know everything fresh would stand to given their clientele so um yeah i mean it's Probably one to watch, but I, I, th I understand your position, Julian. Okay. One so, to, to watch with one eye or both eyes? No, no. So here, here's the thing. Here's the thing, Jay, right? Yeah. So I'm not saying companies don't have difficulty. Mm -hmm. But re remember what I was saying. It's the type of product that they offer. Yeah. So they don't money. Well, they do manufacture because they bought the, the meat, the meat processing plants. Mm -hmm. But what I'm saying is based on the based on the type of product that they have, they're mostly a distributor. Um, I think most of the issues that they're having is in the middle line. It has more to do with liability management. Mm -hmm. And I'm more concerned with execution, right? From, from, from how the companies run, not so much a business model. So fine, in 2019, tourism was at its peak, pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. Let us say we surpassed that level. We continue to get strong tourism um, arrivals, they get more demand and so on. The point is, if you're not able to convert those revenues into profitability because of inadequate liability management, it really won't count for much. Um, so that's my hang up on everything fresh because I expect it better. I really, they don't sell something technical. Yeah. They don't sell something technical. It's something that it... I'm not saying it's easy because it's competitive, but it's a straightforward business model, right? And when you see a straightforward business model with growing revenues and you're not seeing it convert, it do inspire confidence. And after a while, you get impatient. You're just like, come on. Yeah. yeah. Get, get, throw me a bone. So what I would say, once a company is in operation, there's always an opportunity to turn, to turn things around. 
Um, but the same thing that Julian just mentioned, confidence. And I think that, I mean, it, it's just not a company that I look at because based on what I know, what I understand about the company, it's just not something that has been performing, I think, to, to its potential. So I would say that. Mm -hmm. I think they'd be like a perfect example of, you know, why sometimes you don't really just want to rely on the numbers. You have to do a deeper dive into, you know, as Julia mentioned, the, the products and so forth. And yeah. that will ultimately um, give an indication as to the possibility of them sustaining any, any new phone profitability that they might have been able to achieve and all of that. So, I mean, no, the, the, I don't have those scores. I don't have those fours. Remember, I'm a little plebs. I don't have those fours. <laughs> He's not telling it to short everything when it's uh, when short. Oh, yeah. Okay, so we have four minutes to go before we close up. What do you guys think of shorting? What what are your what what are your thoughts? Do you think we're ready for it? Do you think you'd provide good good opportunities? Any general thoughts on it before we close out? I don't think we're ready yet. I think there are some things we need to get straight because if you are going to short, first of all, when you're managing your positions, you want to be able to cover them. So if you if you have a portfolio, right, and you decide that you want to short, many times you want to offset that short to the long position, meaning that there's something that you want to do to balance out your short. If it is that companies are not putting in the adequate information in their MDNA, what is the basis for shorting? You need information. Then there are other more mechanical aspects of the market that need to be ironed out, I think, for us to be more um, efficient, for yeah. example. Um, I think we need longer trading hours. I think that's somewhere we need to, 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 to discuss value creation as opposed to shorting. So I think I think we need to be able to actually buy and sell stocks on our mobile phone and not have to log into our website to do it. Yeah. Um, I think I think I think what a lot of persons are relying on for the shorting is so for example, let's say you have the IPO run up. Most persons kind of know after a certain day, a certain time, or maybe a company had a good run up for earnings and then the report is out and it's not fit. like persons think there are certain um, scenarios where maybe the price downward is a little bit, you know, predictable. So they want to be able to take advantage of those opportunities. That's what yeah, I think the persons are hoping for. I understand. I just think it's it's not time for it. It's something needed, but I think other things should come first. Yeah, yeah. I get you. I get you. Um, my view, I mean, I, I like it, to be honest. Um, you know, it's further deepening of our um, local markets, but I, I have to agree with you guys. I'm not sure if we're actually ready for it. So I believe that's probably why, you know, I, my main concern for it is, you know, the illiquid nature of our market. Um, you know, there's for some companies, there's just not much shares available. So, you know, pretty much to the shorter stock, you borrow the stock and then you sell it at a premium. What if, you know, the, there there's not much um, availability of shares to, to be borrowed? What if there's not much bias to offload that amount of shares? Our market isn't really as liquid as the U.S. ones, as the U.S. markets. And then, you know, the same instance, you know, what if you want to cover your short position and the shares aren't available? You know, you would just be, because, you know, at the end of the day, you're buying the shares, you're paying interest on it. But that time period where you're unable to return the shares, you're incurring in interest costs. Um, if the shares are limited in supply, the price is, the price will, you know, probably go up should you just buy it on the open market so liquidity is really a concern so i believe that's why the jsc has indicated that you know not every stock will um allow for a shorting feature which which concerns me because if you're going to have it and not have it for every stock or for every type of investor should you have it at all yeah maybe i guess my guess is that you know it probably be a phased approach and you know, I decide let's start with the, the big main market the more liquid ones and then uh, so, so like, like for example the, the ability to buy on the, in US and Canadian market we heard that they, that was coming I heard one broker has it haven't heard much information about that yeah 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 
yeah, I haven't, I haven't, I haven't either. Any, any closing thoughts, Jody? We have like literally one minute left. <laughs> so I mean, just on the short end, I think a little bit more. Uh, you have a lot of new investors that came into marketing the probably the past two, three years, and they're just now understanding that you know price go up and down. So I think you know moving to shorting is probably too early a step. I think we still need to do a little bit more market education and understanding um, before we can take on a, a bigger system, thing like yeah. that. I think you know there's quite a bit of still learning that needs to be happening. Um, Amen, sister. Investor. We need to go back to basics. You have too many people buying companies who, are, who don't know how to read financial statements. It can't be. I so mean, that's why I think they'll probably, you know, have it more geared towards the avid investor. Because the, the, I, I, I think there's going to be a lot of restrictions. Does, but does not that put I mean, some persons at an advantage over others? Yeah. I mean, and then oh, yeah, people think you're avid. I mean, I think I'm avid. I'm probably not. But... <laughs> As in, I think, I think all right, based on discussions that are probably overheard that, you know, brokers will actually be instrumental in terms of identifying clients that meet a certain criteria to be able to short a stock. So, for example, not only with respect to, um, you know, the, the cash in your account to, uh, as collateral and so forth, but I believe other factors are considered and pretty much the broker has to select um, clients that are... Um, short worthy so to speak but i mean as i said that's this question that i probably have over her but we just have to probably watch it yeah yeah, yeah. It's and not... i think I, I think in general the my concern is the understanding well one i have a concern with how people are introduced to investing a lot of it is this ipo is of 500 percent i mean you know 500% of my money in three months. So a lot of people come into to investing thinking that, hey, I can, I can double my money very quickly. And so it's it's a lot of, you know, it, it kind of develops or encourages the short-term mindset. And then now you put all your money on an IPO, you get a small amount of shares. And then, you know, after that initial run-up, then nothing else happens for a while. You're off now trying to find the next you know, 100, 200%. So it, it, it kind of develops or encourages this mindset of short-term thinking. No, I, I, it's completely fine, I think, to have short-term goals. I don't think that's the same as short-term thinking. But um, the, the, the education aspect, clearly we think there's, there's opportunity there. That's what we're doing as Learn, Grow, Invest. But I just wish that we could... Um, I listened to the, the, the National Investor Education Week for the, the, the JSE that was, I think it took place yesterday and I think they had something this evening. And it was very interesting to me how they were presenting the opportunities to potential companies to list. I mean, I don't know if you guys have watched that. I think you should watch it and I'd be interested to hear your thoughts in the group because I think the way that they were introducing potential companies to the market was very interesting to me and that tells me if they're being introduced to it a certain way it means they're going to manage their time on the market a certain way which means a lot of the same that we've seen will continue to happen right so it's almost uh this is the minimum that you need to do let's meet the minimum and let's focus on the benefits all right, so I think you guys should check it out and let me know your thoughts. Maybe we can talk about it in a group or something. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much. Really, really do appreciate it. It, it didn't feel like it was two and a half hours. Felt a lot shorter. But thank you all. What we'll do is put each person's pick in the comments. So we will create some chapters. Um, I'll put, well, everyone's handle is here except for Jody. I think, Jody, you're on Instagram, not Twitter, right? Yes. Yes. So follow Jody. Old on... people styling. <laughs> so follow Jody on, on Instagram. Follow Julian, I think, on Twitter and IG. And Andre is on all platforms, so you can follow him there. And of course, follow Learn Grow Invest. Um, Limitless Podcast, I think everybody was saying that you should buy eFresh. So since you're just joining, Julian is very bullish on, on eFresh. 
I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Let me let's just yeah, rewind where, where we're just about to end. So, um, you know, check that out. But it's, it's, yeah, thank you guys so much. Really, really do appreciate it. Um, yeah, so we'll see you guys for the next video. We have the interview with with with, with BMIL tomorrow, so be sure to check that out. Um, if you have not subscribed to our newsletter, please do that. Follow us on Telegram, and um, we're also on Facebook and LinkedIn. Just follow us, connect to us, um, connect with us on all platforms. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you all in the next video. All right. Thanks, everybody. And thanks to Jeremy for giving us this opportunity. Thank you guys for, for accepting. I think it was a great discussion. Much respect right. to Jeremy and the Learn Grow community. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Learning is the key to successful investing. And who doesn't want to invest in some way? Here at Learn Grow Invest, we focus on financial education, all with the aim of sharing our knowledge on personal finance, investing, and building wealth. We do this on the foundation of our faith in God. If a more holistic approach is what you need, check out our Grow Faith-Based Financial Coaching Program. Find out more about us at learngrowinvestclub.com and follow us on all social media platforms.